I lost that much weight mentally it took me back to being that kid again of um, this small skinny kid um, I came back from that tour there's pictures of me and I'm, I'm I think I dropped back into like nine stone 13 or something like that I dropped just below the 10 stone mark and that had an effect on me more because of my insecurities as a, as a kid that um, I'd gone out there, this, this big, strong uh, lad who was fit, physical training instructor, and I was now turning back into this weak, skinny, uh, frail kid. Steve, how are you, brother? I'm very well, Chris. How are you? Yes, mate. I'm, I'm, um, other than the fact I've got vertigo, for anyone listening, it's the second time I've had it and I get it off the computer screen. I don't know what the hell it is. It's something to do with the, 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 the way that the, you know, the data pulses across the screen. It, it hypnotizes me and then it takes, 48 hours to get rid of it and I'm I'm still within <laughs> within that 48 hour period so if I'm looking all over the screen folks I'm not being rude to Steve it's just I can't stare at the same you know I can't like stare at the camera non-stop um AJ Roberts we must thank Steve haven't we for for putting us in contact AJ yeah good lad yeah very good lad AJ, the AJ Roberts podcast for anybody wants to um, check out AJ's show. He gets some fascinating guests. Um, but we're here to talk about you, Steve. So how's uh, how's life? Yeah, it's funny, though, because, you know, you reached out to me and I said this to you that um, I, I'd just come across your work probably uh, two weeks prior. Um, I think I was searching for summer on uh, Google. And uh, it came up and I, and I seen and I clicked on and uh, seen this thing about the Ironmans and stuff that you'd done yourself. And I thought, ah, interesting uh, guy. And I clicked through a few, a few of your things and kind of went down that rabbit hole as you do. And um, yeah, and, uh, and then you reached out, which uh, I'm a big believer in this uh, frequency thing that we, uh, we attract things when we're on this, the same sort of wave level. Yeah, it, it certainly seems to work like that doesn't it it's do you, are you familiar with the concept or the term fl flow state is uh i'm guessing it is it is it kind of to do with energy and law of attraction and stuff like that is it yeah it's massively to do with that it's like if you're eating well right people will hear me talk about alkaline diet a lot it's not a diet it's it's a way of being right that you keep your body like in its 7.25 pH state, which is what we should be under nature, right? Um, you, you lay off the beer and the drugs, or beer is a drug, obviously. Um, you, 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 you know, you make the most of your day, you take action, all the stuff I talk about if I'm ever like in life coaching mode. Yeah. And then what happens is out that action that you take, the universe seems to give you back like, 10 times as much yeah um the opposite to that flow state is when you know you wake up you're depressed so you get out of bed late you 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 should go for a run around the block we think ah oh, we can't be bothered today you know won't have a shower just going to put some telly and and nothing comes from that steve does it you know nothing no. um I'm not not saying that we shouldn't all have a down day now and again. And sometimes if I'm, I, I will just take time off and just 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 do nothing and it helps me reset. But the flow thing is that when you're in that active state and you're firing and you're eating well and you're doing the exercise. You it's like you say, stuff just comes across your plate. That it's almost like it's given to you. 
you know, yeah. somebody that I've been thinking of podcasting maybe for a year, suddenly they're like, there's a, they're emailing me and it's like, yeah. I don't think that's a coincidence. I'm a big believer in uh, frequencies and energy. So uh, um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that. I've got many, many reasons to uh, back that up um, as well. So, uh, yeah. Yes. Should we go back, Steve, and talk about how you joined the, the army and what, what you did while you served? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, the journey started in uh, September 1998. So I'd left school in 94 and uh, I left school. Um, I, I always remember, Chris, that um, my mate, so I'd been left school probably about a year at this point. And uh, one of my very good mates was going into the army and we were all going for a leaving do at his house. And uh, I remember on the way walking around to his house and uh, the guys sort of saying, uh, oh, it's going to be mad, like Al going in the army and stuff like that. And I remember one of those, uh, one of my good mates saying, can you imagine Greeny going in the army? And they're all laughing at me because I left school. I was five foot three. I was absolutely tiny. I was nine stone in weight, um, just very small, very skinny. And uh, I remember them all laughing like uh, about this thing about me going in the army. And I didn't end up going in until about three years later. Um, but I, I get it why they were laughing because I, I literally was the most feeble excuse for a, for a man you could, uh, you could ever meet. And um, I had issues with that. I had self-image self -image issues with um, the fact that uh, I'll talk into my dad a bit more, but um, I, I had this image of, uh, of, of my dad and, and how strong he was and, and how physically and, and mentally tough he was. And uh, he was my hero and, and I was the opposite. Um, I had the mindset, I was very uh, determined. I'd cycled at a high level when I was a kid and uh, I was very fit, but physically to look at me, I was this very frail, skinny, a uh, small kid and uh, I, I had issues with that. So when I actually went in the army, uh, not long after that, after my mates taking the piss out of me at that sort of level um, and a lot of people saying things about me, I actually went to my dad and I said, I want to start doing some training. And, and this will give you an idea of how weak I was, Chris, that I said to my dad, right, I want to start training in the gym with you. And uh, he, he said to me, you can't go anywhere near a gym. He said, when you can do five sets of 15 press-ups, then I'll take you in the gym with me. And it took me three months before I could do five sets of 15 press-ups. And I always remember the first, the first night I'd done it. So he told me to do them every night. He just said, do as many as you can every second night. And uh, I remember the day that I was in my bedroom and I managed to get to the fifth set of uh, 15. And I, I kind of ran downstairs and went, Dad, I've done it. I've done five sets of 15. And he went, right, OK, show me. And I said, well, I won't be able to do it now. I've just done it. So he said, well, you're not ready then. So I attempted to do it. And obviously I was tired because I've just done five sets of 15 and my skinny little arms <laughs> were at the max. And uh, I obviously couldn't do it. So he said to me, right, you need to show me in two days time. So two days time, I went to, to do it. And because my body was still aching, I got to the fifth set and I couldn't do it. I did four sets of 15. And on the last one, I sort of stopped at 10. And he went, you're still not ready. So I was like, for fuck's sake. So I remember a couple of days later, i uh, done it again, went down. I went, right, I've done it again. And he went, right, well, show me. So I had to wait another two days and eventually I'd done it. And he said, right, okay, I'll take you in the gym with me. And I always remember that first session because I've actually got the records. Um, and I actually, I was only benching 23 kilograms for the bench. And I think I'd done about six reps and, uh, that 23 kilos was included in the bar as well. So yeah, 1998, um, I kind of built myself up and uh, I went into the army. I just wanted to get away from uh, where I was. Um, I wanted to get away from the area. I'd started doing drugs, doing a bit of marijuana and stuff like that. And 
I could just see where things were heading. Some of my friends had took things a bit to the next step and got onto heroin. And uh, I just kind of looked and I thought, where am I heading, me, heading here and what am I doing? I need to just get away. And um, I, I always felt that I was destined to achieve things. Um, and, and I couldn't really explain why. I think it was probably just this fire in my belly of always being knocked and, and being written off. And uh, yeah, so September 98, I joined the Royal Engineers purely because uh, my mate Alan had joined and somebody else told me that that was the best regiment, but I didn't know anything about the army whatsoever. Did you, um, did you serve in Germany? Did, uh... I no, I, I, I stayed in Germany uh, a couple of times on the way to other places, but I uh, didn't actually serve in Germany. So um, I done my basic training in Basingborn and then Gibraltar Barracks for my phase two, phase two training. Um, and there's actually a real story behind that as well. So uh, I did my phase one training in September 98, went on to my phase two training in the engineers. Um, by this point when I joined, I'd always been really fit from a kid. So I, I'd played a lot of football. I'd done a lot of running, a lot of cross country. And uh, I used to cycle at a high level, um, national level. Uh, so when I went in, I'd actually, I was fit and I'd now built my body up. I'd actually got in a good physical shape uh, and I looked really well. So when I went in at 21, I was, I probably had an advantage on a lot of the guys. The fact that I was older, a um, bit more mature, and I now started to look like a man. I was uh, fit and I, and I looked healthy. So uh, I went into phase two and uh, week eight, I got a real bad injury and uh, just my shins. And um, I continued with them. And I got to the point where we'd done a CFT, the first loaded uh, eight mile carrying your 36 pound plus your uh, weapon and, and water. And uh, I had to go uh, report to the corporals and show them my knees. They were that badly swollen. And I'd hid this for a few weeks. And uh, they just looked and they went, whoa, shit, they're pretty bad. You need to go to the med centre. And uh, they sent me to the med centre. And I was told straight away that you're going to be pulled out of training and you're going to be, uh, uh, you need some full rehabilitation. You need a rest. And that was absolutely devastating for me. I was two weeks away from passing out, being issued my uh, engineer stable belt and going to my unit. And, uh, and you, I'm guessing you probably uh, remember these times as well, Chris. Uh, back, back in 98, 99, when I went through training, if you went on the sick, the army uh, made a point of humiliating you. And uh, on the top of your combat jacket, we had to wear a big piece of white mine tape and, and that's so you stood out that I'm a sickie. Um, and that's what you were referred to, sick chit or sickie, get the bruise on. Um, and that, that was really difficult for me because I'd had such a insecurity of growing up and being this small kid that everyone had laughed at. Um, I didn't start puberty till after I was 18 year old. So my mates were going in pubs and I hadn't even started puberty at this point. That, that's how small I was and how underdeveloped I was. So to go from that to now being this fit, healthy looking guy, um, and I'd started to feel good about myself. And now I had that stripped away from me again. And it was like walking around on camp with this mind tape and I'm now being called sicky again. And that's not who I was. Um, I was one of the fitter guys in the troop, and that was a really, really tough time for me, to be honest. Yeah, I bet. Did you say you you had problems with your shin, Steve? Yeah, I did. Yeah. What was it like? Because I had I had this thing where the muscles in my shins got too big for the sheaths around them. Yeah, it's compartment syndrome, isn't it? Horrendous. And yeah. Yeah just felt like you got iron painful iron rods down the front of your shin and there's i don't i was lucky they it it flared up once during my time in training and then i only missed one uh speed march or i got asked to 
get in the rat wagon, as they say, the corporal ordered me to, and then I ignored him. And then he saw I'd ignored him and he screamed at me. So at that point, I had to get in the rat wagon. But luckily, by the time we come to do the next thing, and this is towards the end of training, so we've got all our commando tests and stuff coming up, they, it went away again. It just, it, it, it went away. But do you think that's bad, um, bad gait, you know, not landing on the right part of your feet or something? Uh, I think there's, there's a real, because I, I ended up being an army physical training instructor, um, I got quite clued up on shin splints and what people call shin splints is not really shin splints in most cases. So where you've got shin splints, where you've got cracks in the bones, um, compartment syndrome, which is exactly what you've just said, is, is what I had. I didn't actually add cracks in the bones. I had compartment syndrome where the muscles pushing on the bone. Um, and God, that is the most painful thing I have, I've, I've ever felt. It was just... It was horrendous and I had that all the way up my shins and my knees went as well, just just from not being used to carrying weight and, and doing a, a very different, it's, it's very different to running and cycling to someone sticking 40, 50 pound on your back and um, in them horrendous uh, old army boots that we all used to wear. Yeah, so, so sorry, just to clarify what, my understanding of shin splints is you had this compartment syndrome that you mentioned, and then you have the stress fracture, right? They're two yeah. completely, two completely different things. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. When I did, when I ran the length of the country, I had the stress fracture one. <laughs> oh, and uh, yeah, it's hard to negotiate the most injuries you can just run through. It's just your body niggling and, but yeah, something like that. Well, I still ran through it. I had to, but you're running through it at at quite some some pain, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like nowadays, um, uh, training's changed a lot. And, and not that I know, because I'm not in it. I haven't been in ten years. But my mates that I served with, um, they just said you you wouldn't last. You 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 wouldn't be able to handle the army now. The way that you are with that that sort of um, just crack on mentality, that old school mentality. It's just not like that anymore. And I mean, I always remember in basic training and I, I could handle myself. So when I joined the army, I'd, I'd got into a bit of bother and stuff and I'd, I'd built myself up. I was fit, I was strong and I, I was starting to get into a few battles in the hometown and stuff like that. I went in the army, I could handle myself, but you just had a respect for your leaders. And I always remember cocking up in basic training. Um, and and I, I laugh now because I know it is an absolute schoolboy error. Um, I remember we were live firing on the ranges and I got a stoppage on my weapon. And I literally, with a, a live weapon, just turned around 180 the other way, pointing my weapon at all the corporals and just went, my weapon stopped firing. And I just remember um, my weapon just flying out my hand and I'd been booted in the ribs by one of my corporals and this, this weapon just flies up in the air, takes it off me, grabs hold of me by my helmet and just drags me off, um, starts ragging me about around the back of the building. I, I look at that and I never, ever lashed out or anything like that. I took it on the chin because the reality is I could have killed someone there with that, that mistake. It was, it was that much of a schoolboy error. I, I could have literally took somebody's life by pointing that weapon the other way. And it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. They call it snowflake culture, don't they? Yeah. And the, the army in its absolute lack of wisdom, well, obviously it wasn't the army. It was a private promotion company brought out this advertising campaign. Um, and I spoke to Robin Horsfall about it, the uh, SAS Iranian embassy siege trooper. Yeah. Or one of them, I should say. And, you know, he, he, he's, a, he's a guy that just will speak his truth, right? And he's like, why don't they tell you when you join the army that, like, you might get dead? <laughs> yeah. Know, a big part of the job is, is, for a lot of people, is getting shot dead. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what 
is there a place in the army for snowflakes? Is it a changing environment now? Because, you know, you could be operating a drone from London, never ever setting foot in a, you know, in an area of conflict in, in your whole career. And your skill might be, you know, guiding yeah. in a guiding in a missile because you're bloody good at Xbox or something, right? Yeah, funny uh, times. What 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 do we think? I guess it's fit for purpose, isn't it? Um, it's it's not the army that I'd want to join. That's for sure. Um, I, I know I sit on the fence of. Um, I, I don't believe in getting sick. I don't believe in. Um, complaining i don't believe in uh, injuries and that's why although we get them and I've, I've, i'm actually carrying some now from the latest event that i've done that just crack on mentality is it's the way i was brought up my dad was tough with me um i, I was laughing about this the other day with my partner um we, we were talking about she's just come back from dubai and we were talking about jet lag and I always remember going to America when I was a kid in my last year of school. And uh, I'd have been 16 years old. And all of the rest of the people, we flew back on a, on a Sunday night, landed early hours of the Monday morning, and everybody else got the day off. And my dad was like, ah, he, he came in the bedroom, dragged me out the bed as he used to, Get your, get your uniform on, you're going to school. And I was like, I was seven hours behind on time for two weeks, um, massively jet lagged, just flew back. And he was like, you're fucking going to school. And I remember all week being knackered. And as you do at 16 years old, I'd come, I came home from school on the first night, nearly falling asleep all day. But you then want to go out with your mates. You want to go um, to the youth club. You want to go see the girls kick the ball about and stuff and, I remember going out and getting back in at nine o'clock and telling him I was knackered and him saying, you can't be that tired, otherwise you'd have went to bed after school. And I remember all that week just being absolutely knackered. And uh, by the time I'd finished school, wanting to go out, and, and he just kept, he, he was always just really tough that way. Um, it was just, there's your bike, get on it, don't don't ask questions and just do as I, as I say. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's had a big impact on the person that I am today. So, yeah, snowflakes are not for me. I can't, I can't work with people like that. Um, that. That word in the background, it's been drummed into me prior to the army and, and all the way through. So I guess there is a place for, uh, for these drones and stuff like that. It's a very different world now. And um, I guess it's... Uh, more of a thinking man's battle rather than a physical man's battle it's not just the you know the it's not just the level of um or the entry levels that the forces are, are playing around with though i mean there's other things to consider like my little lad likes to watch youtube right and Jesus, some of the stuff. Uh, and I've had to have I've had conversations with this with my girlfriend about is this is this what we want? You, you know, it, it's hard being a parent, isn't it? You know, it's you, you I, I want him to grow up, I want him to understand the world, I want him to be able to use technology. Um, but on the other hand, I don't want him to think this is the new normal, right? Yeah. And by that I mean the thing the thing he was watching yesterday was a bunch of of what must be like 28, 27 year old lads. And there's a lot of stuff like pe people who, whose kids watch this sort of stuff will know exactly what I'm on about. And basically they go out in the nature or they go to a, a shop first or a store as, they, as our American brothers and sisters call them. They'll spend a thousand dollars on just shit, junk, you know. Yeah absolute toss stuff they're not prepared to like master how this stuff works or and then they go into nature and attempt to build something right but they're all massive biffs they've, they've never had a dad to teach them you know how you use a saw and what a hammer is and so they get masking tape right <laughs> 
this is ringing bells for anyone that's been in the military, but they get masking tape and they're, you know, and it's, it's such a clusterfuck. This thing is never going to work, mate, because you, you don't understand. You yeah. can't do that like that. It's not, it, it's against mm -hmm. every law of engineering and every law of, of physics. That is, um, and then of course, that stuff is just junk then there's there's all this plastic crap that is going to end up in the ocean right because these idiots have just used it once for a youtube video they probably left it in a nature to be honest right yeah. at the worst it's all gone into landfill and that's all going to soak through into into the river system into the seas and then you've got the fact they're 28 year old blokes right when i was 19 and I'm not saying this is right, folks, and I'm not slagging off young people. I'm just raising this point to see where the hell the armed forces sit, sits in modern, modern day life. Because they're 28, half of them wear their, their, their jeans halfway down their ass, right? Showing all their, you know, their boxer shorts. And they're rampaging around a company making these videos that are just shit, right? I said to my girlfriend yesterday, I said, look, if they actually stopped now and pointed out that building there and discussed its history and what, you know, is that a shepherd's hut? Is that a farmer's thing? Is, you know, what's this doing in the nature? Or they discuss the weather system or the ecosystem coming in. Or, you know, they, they made reference to being in the great out this would be a great video, right? Yeah. I get it. I get it. It would get zero freaking hits, right? This is what us content creators, it's our curse. You put the good stuff out. Sadly, everyone's so mind screwed. I'm using the word screwed there instead of the word I want to use, but they're all so mind screwed that they can't, you can't soak in decent stuff anymore. It's got to be quick, fast, junky shit that is, never going to get you anywhere in life right it's never yeah. going to educate you it's never going to get you to see the truth it's never going to get you to understand you know how society works yeah. against you 99.999 percent of the time so no i totally agree with that chris uh, I, I put a post out about this the other day just saying as a society we've become weak we need we need to toughen up um I think that, okay, maybe it's the days of booting people in the ribs like uh, we probably got. And I, I got a few, I remember on a few occasions getting uh, um, my bosses, my sergeants, my sergeant majors saying head or gut was, was the old question. I don't know if you, uh, you got that as well, if you cocked up and it was, do you want the punch in the head or do you want the punch in the gut? Um, I think those days we did need to move away from that um, and, and, and probably a bit more in this coaching environment. But I think we've gone too far the other way. It's not just the UK, I think the world in general has gone way too soft. And I think we, we, we've probably got that balance wrong and need to go back the other way a little bit. Yeah, so I talk about this a lot, Steve. Um, I don't know if now's the right time for it, but I'm massive... I'm massing, massive for trying to wake people's eyes up to the agenda that's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen that. There, there, yeah. There, there's a reason for all this. There's a reason for destroying our culture, for this mass uh, it, unchecked immigration that we're experiencing, for certain people in society to get away with anything and then for other groups to be like hammered hard. It's all social engineering. Yeah. What they want is a docile, thick, infeminate young man who can't fight for himself, let alone fight for what's right for his uh, people. Right. And by that, you know, I I'm an Englishman. Um, and it's it re I'm going to actually do next week. I've got a guy called Richard Willett coming on the podcast and we're just going to help people to understand what's going on and um, how it all relates to this Orwellian agenda that George Orwell wrote, wrote about the language, you know? Yeah. That people don't understand our lung language is being simplified. It's being dumped down and it's having all the, you know, 
all the corners gently polished off it, right? People now say passed when what they mean is, is died, right? Yeah. And you see how weak people are just copying that word. They hear something and then they start saying it, right? Yeah. They think, oh, that that's like the politically correct or that that makes me, you know, I, I'm right. To, and it's not. It's all agenda. It's all to soften down the reality of life to get us living in a fuzzy bubble where if you want to wake up one day and choose that your gender is now, you know, pink, fluffy unicorn, then that's perfectly, fu you know, it's yeah. freaking not, you, you know, it, it it's just not. It's it, We're lying to our children, right? People say they want to, you know, Chris, I never joined the Marines. I, I, I regret it for the No, joining the Marines don't make you a warrior. What makes you a warrior is standing up for what is right, standing up for the children, standing up for their future, yeah. not allowing them to be subject to these sociopaths that are just destroying everything so that they can control, you know, the whole show am i making any sense steve or a no, 100 percent um I, i'm very much uh that that way inclined as well of uh i think more people need to speak out i think uh we do need to toughen up a bit more and, and I, i'm like that with my kids i mean financially um i'm well off but i don't spoil my kids at all the, my kids probably get less than what the average kids get um I'm more for taking them out and and, and sometimes I am tough on them and, and uh, my, my partner says sometimes you're a bit hard and, and I just say no they need that the uh, they need that experience because when I'm not here they need to be able to learn that life's not easy and sometimes it's going to throw shit at you and I want them to be prepared for that um, mentally I don't care what I leave my kids financially at all I want to leave them where they can control their own mindset and they're able to generate their own wealth and uh, they're not going to fall off the end of a planet just because that somebody said something about them or um, life's thrown them a challenge. I, I want them to be able to handle the shit that life throws at you. Yeah. They've also, you know, this whole social media malarkey just, and I know we're all a part of it because you've, you've got to be. It's modern life, right? Um, but it's all just so bloody wrong. You know? Yeah. You, you, people genuinely now think if you have a keyboard in front of you, that, that's your right to say so. And it's fucking not. You yeah. know, the stuff that people say to each other. They never would have said that. And yeah, I'm older than you, Steve. They definitely wouldn't have said it in my day. Do you know why? Because bang, you'd have the decency knocked into you. And I'm not, I am don't condone unwarranted physical violence, right? But what it did in my day is it acted as a check to stop people becoming a fucking dickhead. Yeah, and, definitely. You know, you could you could have a laugh with someone, fine. You could have a joke, that, that's okay. You could take the mickey out, you, you know, de depending on what the scenario, that, that was okay. But if you overstep the mark and you act just disrespectfully disrespected someone. Yeah. You, they would turn around and just punch you in the face, right? And then you'd go, ah, I, I overstepped the mark. Oh, yeah, sorry, fair one. Oh, oh, oh. And for the rest of your life, then you you knew where the line was, right? Yeah. You knew where the line was. Now, you know, now in a situation where people think, oh, I've got a keyboard in front of me. I'm allowed to say whatever I, I, I want. And it's like, dude, you wouldn't say that to this person's face. No. Ever. <laughs> right you wouldn't go on this person's podcast and say you're a coward yeah you haven't got the guts right and yeah no i agree i think it's uh i think there's a lot of respect being lost um you you, you triggered a, a memory there of when i was 19 years old 1920 it was before i went in the army and i'd left school i was probably about 19 20 years old 
Um, and it was when I'd started to put some weight on, I, I was quite uh, physically, I'd, I'd put a couple of stone on him where I started to look quite uh, physically strong. And, and I was starting to get quite physically strong. And I remember in my, my dad's house of um, him questioning me about summer. And I just told him to shut up. I, I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, stop going on all the time. And he literally ran at me and he just punched me in the side of the head. And he, he just, it was just, I was laid out on the floor and he kind of grabbed hold of me and went, don't you ever fucking speak to me like that in my house. And uh, I, I remember uh, disappearing for a few days to my mates and sleeping on the couch. And, and again, I don't condone that. And I, I don't raise my hands to my kids. I think there's another way of doing that. And, uh, and my dad says that now that that was just the, the, the thing then. And he looks and he says that he would never do it now because he, he's learned that that's not the best way. But I also look as well, it never done me any harm. Um, I've, I've always had respect for people. Uh, when I went in the military, when I went into people's homes, I'd take my shoes off them. Them old school values that my dad drummed into me. Um, I, I don't believe they've done me any harm. And, and if, if I had my time again, um, I wouldn't change anything. And I remember my dad being a complete ass at times. Like I, I remember one Christmas waking up at, probably 16 years old or something like that. And a few days before Christmas, he was kind of saying to me, look, you, you're not getting anything, you know, you, you're going to get this, you're going to get a bit of money in a card and you'll get one or two things. You're not a kid now. Um, you, you, you've left school. You, you're a man now. And and I was like kind of saying, yeah, yeah. And I, I genuinely wasn't bothered. And I was just saying, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And he brought this up for about two days and he kept saying, look, I'm not joking, you know, you're going to get a bit of money and you're going to get one or two things. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I get it. I get it. And he obviously thought that I didn't believe it. And I was going to get this big chair full of presents as you do as a kid. And I remember on New Year's Eve, um, the, the night before, he said to me, he went, look, I want to have a word here. And he said, you're only getting some money and a couple of things. And I said, I know, Dad, you've already said it on a few occasions. And, and I was genuinely, I wasn't bothered. And I remember he lost his temper and he literally, he went into the cupboard, pulled all these presents out and, and probably five or six presents and started unwrapping them all, ripping the paper off them all and going, that's what you've fucking got. Now you've seen it all. And I remember him ruining my Christmas day like, shouting at me and being full on um and again i'm not condoning that but that's what i believe made me as tough as what i am that that's what got me through a world record that's what got me through two iron mans that's what got me through p company um that's what that's why i strive to to have that that level of pride and and that that i've got so I'd never change anything at all. Um, I don't agree with it in, in, in the respect of what he done. I'd never do that with my kids. Um, but it's also made me the man that I am today. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Some of the stuff you're saying is like, it's just, it's like listening to my childhood, right? Um, I think what it is, is there's a line again there's a line there in the way you interact with children where a good tough lesson is fine it's when it traumatizes them that that's yeah. when it that's but but then you know i remember being homeless for the first time i think i was 15 i stood at the end of my row because i obviously couldn't couldn't go back to the house I'm in my freaking school uniform for crying out loud, right? And I'm smoking a ciggy. And even in that moment, Steve, I went, do you know what? I wouldn't change this for the world. Yeah. I thought, I don't want an easy life. Because if I had an easy life, I'd be missing out on this experience now, being homeless, smoking a fag at the end of my you know when all my mates are going off to school and I, I, I don't know what to do I'm a man of leisure yeah. <laughs> I could do what I want with my day don't know where I'm going to sleep but I can do what I, but I'm making light of it but I do remember thinking god if I didn't have these tough experiences I I, I just didn't want to trade them 
you know I, I know that sounds crazy on the, on the one hand I didn't the some of the stuff I had to go through and I won't even go there it just wasn't very pleasant certainly wasn't the stuff you know you look back with fondness at your childhood yeah um it but it provided a great lesson in yeah. in what kind of adult am I never going to be right no I got it you know I'm never going to be an adult that puts a rule on 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 my children that there's no re you know there's no logic beyond the rule it doesn't achieve any you know I'm not just going to do it just because my parents did it right yeah it, kind of this kind of thing but this um you mentioned P company there how's that yeah. how's that for you well, it was a, again. There's a bit of story behind that. So I, I was I wanted to do P Company after training. So I had to go on the sick. I was forced. I could hardly walk. I built myself up. I took that shit in the training. I went back into training, um, and then uh, I wanted to go do P Company. And I was told by the physio and the doctor that um, there's there's no way you can go do P Company. You're not long after a real bad injury. <clears throat> that that was two and a half months I was on the sick for, and uh, they just said, "Look, you, you're not going to pass. You, even if you were in peak physical condition, it puts immense strain on the body. And uh, for somebody who's just recovered from that injury, you're not going to pass it anyway." I was stubborn as I was, and I was like, "No, no, I'm I'm still going." And a week before I went. Uh, I got on with the uh, the rehabilitation instructor and he pulled me to one side and he just said, look, go to your unit, get six months behind your belt, just build your legs up a little bit more. You can go and apply for it once you're in your unit. Um, and I wasn't aware you could do that. So I took his advice and I pulled off it. I went to my unit and it was one of those things I just never got, got around to doing it. Um, until I went to training regiment and uh, again it came off the back of another failure and uh, people look at me now and they say well <clears throat> you've done all of these things you've achieved this um, you've built this eight million pound property portfolio um, you've you've had all, uh, quite a lot of success in a lot of people's eyes but I've had a hell of a lot of failures as well and uh, one of the things was training for PT course selection and uh, I trained for that and I never got selected. And again, I was absolutely gutted because I put everything into it. And I remember finishing that and um, one of my mates coming in my room and just uh, sort of, are you all right? And he knew I was gutted. And he just said, look, why don't you go do P company? He said, you're only going to be judged on your fitness. It's not on somebody's opinion. And uh, I thought, yeah, that's it. That's the answer. I'm going to bounce back. And I went straight to my boss and said, I want to go do P Company. And initially he wouldn't let me. He said, look, you're quite emotional right now. Um, you've just come off the back of, of not being selected. Go take a bit of time at home. And after, so I went home and after a few days, I rang my boss and said, I want to do it. I have to do it because it was affecting my identity. This person that had now become this I was a, a physical training instructor. I was in real good shape, uh, really, really fit. And uh, it was kind of taking me back to that being that kid again, then that, that insecurity. And I thought, I have to do this for myself. And failing was not an option. And uh, I remember going on that and people were saying to me, oh, you, you'll piss it, you'll fly through, you, you're really fit. And I was, I was one of the fittest guys on camp. Uh, but wow, I, I was not expecting that at all. Um, anybody who says to me that they, they found P Company, uh, they were comfortable on it, I, I, you've got my respect because I didn't. I, I found it really, really hard. Um, and, and that's me just being honest. I In the first week, I remember coming home and just thinking, shit, this shouldn't even be allowed. Um, the thrashings that we got for like three, four hours uh, that were just absolutely brutal and then two sessions a day. And you, you'll know from uh, from being Marine sort of background um, of, of, of what these courses are they're set there to put you under immense pressure, immense stress, sleep deprivation. And um, I picked up an injury on that and it was kind of like, oh shit, here we go again. And I just thought failing is not an option because... If I'd have failed that as well as, 
I don't know what it had done for me mentally. And uh, I just continued through that. And um, I, I remember on, my, on the log race, which was by far the hardest thing that sticks out in my mind, and uh, I literally collapsed as we, we came over the line. It was, um, that, that, that's how much I'd been pushed. And um, them courses are set there for, uh, to break most people. And you'll know that the pass rate on uh, any sort of commando, Marines, para train and anything like that, the pass rate is, uh, is very, very small. And uh, I was certainly put through my paces and, uh, I look back on those times and probably uh, one of the most proudest moments was being awarded that maroon berry um, because I knew I'd put everything into it. I couldn't have put anything more. I left nothing in the tank. And uh, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but on P Company, um, again, the setup is brutal. So you finish the last event and uh, you get told to go get changed and, and you've got a parade and you're all stood on parade, they shout your number out, uh, you shout, yes, sir, and they just shout either pass or fail. And if that's a fail, you've got to uh, fall out of the troop, walk behind the group and go face the wall. You're not even allowed to look at the instructors if you've failed um, why everybody else is being handed the berries and... Um, I remember him shouting my number out and shouting, yes, sir. And it, it, that, them few seconds just felt like it was about two minutes. Um, and them saying the words pass. Uh, and I remember I, I started to fill up um, because I, it was just kind of like, fuck, I've done it. Thank, thank fuck for that because I put everything into it. And um, if that had been a fail, there was nothing more I could have done because... Uh, I was, I was really fit. I was really strong mentally. Um, I, was a, I was at a good age. Um, I couldn't have done any more, but yeah, extremely tough. And I've got massive respect for anybody who's... Uh, I know there's that rivalry between Marines and Paras and the SES and SBS and stuff like that, but anybody who's gone to that level to pass any training like that, they've got respect for me. Mm. Yeah, I'm smiling a bit because there never really was a rivalry for us Marines. It, 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 it's um, the shit had, stuff went on. But um, what I mean is, I don't think in the Marines it was such a rivalry as, the, as it was in the Paras. Yeah, I'd agree um, with that. You know, like to be honest, mate, we didn't really care. Yeah. Um, but there were interesting uh, situations. There was one troop on the on the range one day, and um, there, there was a group. There was a. I, I don't know if they were recruits or, or or qualified. I think they were recruits. But there was one group of paras on the range and one group of young marines, and the paras started singing what they used to was. I surrender, I surrender, which was, to be honest, I've seen them singing that. This is, this is, this highlights my point. I, I was on the range one day and I heard all the Paris singing that. I was the only one in, in my troop that I knew what they were on about. They're referring yeah. to the folk, the, the uh, initial invasion of the Falklands for people listening. Um, but it was all like on deaf ears on everyone else. Yeah. But this driver I was with, uh, we're chatting to one day. He was. He said his troop was on the range, and the, and the paras started singing that. <laughs> he said, and the the instructor went, right, let's fucking have them. <laughs> there was a, a a big fight, bro. A big fucking fight that. broke out. Um, can you just talk us quickly through P Company? Because I reckon there's a lot of people watching this that will be fascinated in like what i mean i know the basics you got the high the high assault Medium, yeah yeah well over to you steve yeah so you were uh, the way that uh, it was done when i went through was uh, the engineers you had uh, four weeks training with the engineers so you had to be at a certain level before you'd even get on the uh, the engineer pre-para 
and uh, the engineers took you through their four weeks of build up, which uh, was two sessions a day. The first one was usually around about six o'clock in the morning on parade for five o'clock to get your weapon. Um, the usual water bottle had to be full right to the top. If it wasn't, it went over your head, um, which left you wet and uncomfortable before you've even got out. You stood on parade for maybe 30, 40 minutes, um, freezing and fucking soaking because your instructor's just made you pour your, your bottle of water over your head. Um, you then go do a probably two to three hour session uh, in the hills carrying a uh, full weapon uh, round your waist with all your kit in, your, your uh, Bergen, 36 pound, your water and your, your weapon. Um, and that was just a thrashing. That's the only way I can put it. It was just run fast up hills. Um, and then uh, you came back, you were allowed some food, get a shower. And they used to tell you to go to sleep. Um, which was, it was one of the good things about it, was kind of come back, go get yourself asleep for a couple of hours. And then at one o'clock, you'd go back out for your second session. And uh, again, that was a, a rock hard session, probably around about an hour to an hour and a half, not as long. And it was just that every day, you got the weekends off. Um, and then if you got through that stage, you would then go on the all arms pre-para and... Uh, Again, that was just a complete thrashing for two and a half weeks, similar sort of set up uh, on the morning. You'd be out running Bergen on up the hills. Um, and then on the afternoon, you'd have another session, might be a long run, uh, carrying your weapon and your webbing uh, or a, a, a gym session. And then if you got through all of that, you then went on to test week, um, which for us guys is a series of eight tests um, all designed to challenge you in a different way. And uh, I think the two ways, and you've probably talked into this before, Chris, is the difference in the tests for the, uh, the commandos and the Marines versus the paras is um, you guys tend to uh, carry a lot more weight, uh, a little bit slower. Us guys will carry less weight, but moving at a, a quicker pace. Um, and uh, those tests, uh, you start off, um, one of the first tests is the trinasium, which you just mentioned, and that's a straight pass or fail. Uh, you're on the 60 foot high shuffle bars, no railings, no safety net, um, walking across those bars. And if, if you fail to go over those bars or to do the illusion jump, uh, any of those things, it's an instant fail. So you've just done practically most people have probably done four months training before they've even got there. And then they've just done best part of three, four months on the actual course to get an instant fail. So, and some people did, some people, um, they got up on them 60 foot shuffle bars and I'm not scared of heights, but I was nervous up there. It's when you're sliding across a little scaffold bar like that, um, and you've got no railings and you're looking down and you think, shit, this is I. Um, and, and, and it is. And some guys fail to do that, which was an instant fail. Uh, some of the other tests is um, a two miler. So that's carrying full kit, carrying your weapon, carrying your Bergen um, and your weapon. And you've got to do two miles in 18 minutes, which... Um, is moving at a, a pretty rapid pace considering you're carrying full kit. Uh, then there's the 10 miler. So you're doing 10 miles in uh, one hour 50, again, over very hilly terrain, carrying your weapon, uh, your Bergen. Um, and then one of the, uh, the ones I found quite hard was actually the 20 miler. Um, not particularly that fast, um, four hours 40 for, for 20 mile. But again, it was just more the terrain and um, that really grinds you down. But for me, by far, the hardest out of the entire lot was the log run. And uh, if you look at the log run on paper, you wouldn't think it was that hard. I I'd done hundreds and hundreds of log runs um, in the army. By that point, I'd been in eight years and I I'd done... When I say hundreds, I mean hundreds. I, I, I was a PTI at training reg and used to always jump on the log. But 
the way they set up the log run on P Company, it's just absolutely brutal. It, it's only 1.9 mile. You're carrying, I think the, uh, the log's about 60, 70 kilos. I forget the exact weight, but it's just the sheer pace that it moves at. So what they get you to do is there's nine people on the log that you start with and your arm has to be in this position. So you're pulling it with a straight arm. You can't have your arm. As soon as your arm drops like that, the, you're not dragging the log forward. So you get a warning, it's a tap. First warning, second warning, you pulled off. There's a red card you've potentially failed after three months of hard work. Um, so everybody's pulling the log and it just keeps generating more and more pace. And uh, your heart rate is at such a high level. I was just hyperventilating. Um, in my head, um, I, I, I'm a tough character. I've been brought up with that with my dad thrashing me, sending me out on my bike in all weathers. Um, I was an army physical training instructor. I was strong. I was fit. But I was having some serious conversations in my own head of, fuck, can I do this? And as people start dropping off the log, the weight of the log just got, gets heavier and heavier. And the further you're getting round and the more people that are coming off it, and eventually we finished with four people on our log. And I, I remember seeing the finish line and I'm talking literally nothing more than a hundred meters in front of me. And I, I could feel my legs buckling. I, I'd just literally gone and I was thinking, shit, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Even though it was so close and I was kind of coming up to it the last 50 meters and my legs were starting to stumble underneath of me hyperventilating, just slava coming out of my mouth, like literally losing control of my bodily functions. And uh, I, I literally, I, I just, I fall over the line. And um, But the weird thing with that is I always ask myself, and I think this is where that sick sort of um, pushing myself comes from. I always think, what happens if that finish line had been just one meter further? Would I have made it? And the answer is yes, I would have. And then I asked myself, what happens if that finish line had been another 10 meters? What happens if it had been another 100 meters? Um, and I, I just think that we don't tap into anything near where what we're capable of. And I, I certainly found that when I did the double Ironman back to back and um, when I thought I was at my limit and I'd only done one Ironman and for anybody who's done a single Ironman, uh, again, I've got massive respect to them because um, extremely challenging and, and to finish one and to go straight into a second one and start it all over again when it was one o'clock in the morning, it was freezing. Um, again, that was massively challenging and it just made me realise how much more we're capable of massively yes let's let's come on and talk about that steve that's um that's the sort of stuff i love love to discuss but um going back to your time in the military then did you go on many active deployments yeah i did quite a lot um i did uh, saudi arabia uh kuwait uh oman uh rap twice afghanistan um and then I did a few few nice places as well. So I got the uh, opportunity to go to Australia, Canada, Hawaii, um, Kenya, which was an, another experience. So yeah, uh, Falklands twice. So yeah, I, I got about in the military, um, done quite a lot of uh, tours. And were you in the thick of it at all? Were the, were the rounds flying and things going bang? Yeah, I think uh, th the first probably realization for me was um, um, was going to Afghanistan, and uh, I remember us uh, boarding the uh, the, uh, the helicopter and um, kind of like shit. The speed that we were coming down, and we were told that we had to land at night because there would be uh, RPGs, rocket propeller rocket propelled grenades for people who don't know and they fire those at the at the helicopters and the planes as you're as you as you're landing and um I, I remember coming down and just thinking on the herc and just like shit 
it literally felt like we were falling out of the sky because they were, they were having to come down at such a rapid rate so they couldn't uh, take us out with the missiles. And um, it, it, it literally, it was scary. Um, and I remember one of my mates had sort of warned me for the landing that, that we were going to have because uh, in Afghanistan, you've got all the mountains and you, you're really exposed for, for those missile attacks on the, on, on the helicopters. And sometimes they get taken out. Um, there, were, there was an helicopter that, that got hit around about the time that we were out there. And uh, I think there was four guys in that, plus the pilot and stuff like that. And um, this sometimes happens. They get taken out in mid-flight and the, uh, the pilot's just bringing that down at a rapid rate to, to, to get you out of sort of range. I remember uh, I was getting off, uh, off the Herc and just going to the tents. And on the very first night, um, you literally, you just heard it. You, you heard it come over the top of the tents and, uh, and, and, and the missile landed at the back end of camp, um, hit where the, uh, where the uh, Hesco Bastion um, protection was. If that had landed on the tents, you, you're taking a full tent out and there's nothing you can do to defend against that. And for me, that, that first realisation of, shit, we're just sat here like sitting ducks. They're, they're up there in their mountains and they're able to just fire these missiles at us and we're just hoping that they don't land on our tent. And um, in that first week, I, I remember sort of three or four of them missiles landing very closely at the tents. Um, and sometimes they would land on the tents and they take people out and, and lads would be killed. Um, there was nothing you could do about that. Um, and as you know, eventually you start to switch off from that stuff. Um, I, I, I remember as well going into Iraq and crossing the border and being told I was doing top cover. And um, you, you just prime for being taken out by the snipers. So you're in the top of obviously the wagons and you understand this, Chris. So you're in the dats and they've got this big round hole where you're stood up. Uh, out of the top of the vehicle giving top cover and uh, I was a fairly young lad then I'd, I'd passed my PTI course I hadn't been promoted and I got told it, it was sort of the guys that it was always one of the younger members so if the snipers were going to take you out they weren't taking out one of the one of your section commanders or something like that but it was usually one of the young lads that were about to be promoted so they were pretty switched on um ready to take a leadership role but if you were killed by a sniper it wasn't gonna have as much damage as taking out a section commander or an officer and I was told that right you're going top cover and it was kind of like shit um, and I remember being top cover coming across the border into Iraq and um, being very very vigilant just looking all over um, because as you know, them snipers, the shit off and, and they, they can pretty much, um, I, I was speaking to one of my mates the other day and um, he was telling us that the, the snipers killed one of his mates because they got wise to our body armour uh, being exposed down the side. Yeah. And a uh, sniper had just watched him through the binoculars and when he turned round on the side, they'd waited for him to get a drink of his water bottle and as he's brought his arm up like that and created that tiny little gap on the side, Sniper just took him out. And th these guys can hit, could hit a penny from, from practically a mile away and, and you're doing top cover um, and you're seeing the infantry that we'd followed behind and there's, there's cars and stuff like that that are on the, the rooftops and... And obviously the RAF had been in the tornadoes and you're just like, shit, what's been happening here? And um, as you're coming across the border and you're doing that top cover, I don't think I've ever been as vigilant in my life for that probably uh, hour that I had to uh, do that top cover. And, and fortunately, we didn't get um, any sort of fire at us at that particular period for... Um, once we went into Iraq, um, again, another big eye-opener eye for me. And uh, I kind of look back and think, why did nobody sort of tell us these things? I remember uh, prepping to go to Iraq and prep, as engineers, our role was to disarm uh, bombs. Um, that's what I'm trained to do. 
and uh Steve, ah. can i can i just stop you because i yeah yeah i very rudely didn't ask who did you join when when you got your cherry berry what what, what do, do, do you you might want to explain that for 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 those of us that don't know yeah so in the royal engineers um if if you pass uh p company um you, you haven't gone through the para route. You, the engineers and the signals and, and other forces, the other, other armed forces, um, different cat badges have a way where you can go do the commando course and the para course yourself. And that's what I've done. I've done the all arms course. Um, and for us guys, it was, um, I think it's two, three, you come under two, three uh, air brigade, which, um, the main squadron for our guys then was uh, was was nine para squadron, um, which uh, a lot of the uh, the airborne lads used to go to. But um, yeah, I just think um, a, a lot of stuff you you kind of thrown in the deep end, Chris. Um, I, I always remember it in in Iraq, <clears throat> and um, we were walking along, had our weapons strapped to our backs, and. Um, literally the loudest explosion and it sounded like it was so close it literally sounded like a missile had landed on our heads it was that that i just knew it was that close and i remember diving and hitting the ground and my mate just stood up and kind of like laughing at me because he'd been out there about a month before and i was like fuck what the hell was that and uh, he said, oh, it's fine. It's just Patriots. And I was like, what do you mean? Pat what do you mean? And he, he, he just like looked dead relaxed as if it was a normal thing. And it was the American, obviously, um, anti-missile device that they had, which um, knew if there was a missile inbound and, and that used to intercept the missiles in the air. And, and it was just the, the device that was close to us had, uh, had launched to, uh, to accept an incoming missile. And he said to us that Patriot, it's, it's faster than our device. He said, the alarms will go off in a minute. And uh, literally at that second, the alarms went off and we had to run to the bunkers. And um, that, that first time of experiencing that, and, and we didn't know if they had chemical weapons. And I remember flying into this bunker for the first time and our Sergeant Major of one of the squadrons running in, um, and guys, it, they'd shut the battens down, and, and this guy was on the outside, brain on the actual uh, door, and it was that risk of, um, do you open the door and potentially kill all of those soldiers that are, are underground in, in the bunker, um, or do you open it to let somebody in on the outside? And anyway, the decision was made to, to open the door, and uh, I remember the sergeant major coming in and, and literally falling over on the floor. And it was just sheer carnage inside because we just thought, fuck, he's, he's having the effects of a chemical attack. Um, and you just literally, you're fastening everything up, strapping your respirator as tight as you possibly can, thinking, fuck, if any of that, that's come on the inside, we're all dead. And that, that's what you're literally thinking. And... <clears throat> um, what he'd actually done, um, and this was quite a joke in the engineers, was um, the sergeant major had been asleep in his uh, camp cot. This alarm's gone off. He's woke up disorientated, like, shit, what's going on? Thought he'd had, a, had the effects of a chemical attack, um, and he'd gone and stuck his uh, pen in his own leg, and he was now suffering from, um, uh, is it at atropine, isn't it? Is it yeah. um, so, so we're talking to our friends at home, we're talking about the EpiPen as we use Yeah, them. that's it, yeah. It's like a, an antidote to if you get chemically poisoned, you whack it in your leg quickly or someone whacks it in your leg. And uh, this Sergeant Major's obviously jumped the gun a bit. Yeah. And whatever chemicals is in that injection, I don't think you want them in your body too many times in, in your life. Well, again, you can die from that cart year. I think it can actually uh, it can actually kill you. And the act to then go give him something to counteract the pen that he's gone and put in his own leg. But um, he was literally all over the, the effects of whacking that pen into his own leg. And we just thought that it was a chemical attack. We just thought, shit, that um, 
it was the effects of uh, of a nuclear attack, and it's uh, it that was really really scary for me that time in that bunker because you're just expecting, and and as you know, Chris, you're taught that you're going to start uh, involuntary shitting yourself, being sick, your your skin's going to start melting off, and um, I don't think I've ever tightened my respirator up in my kit as tight as that in my life. We had a situation, Steve, when we were, I was top cover in um, Belfast one day. We're in patrolling through the Ardoin. Ardoin, for anyone listening, is, was one of the, the, the most hardened Republican areas in, in Northern Ireland, or certainly in Belfast. Um, you drive through there, you're on tenter hooks because even the three-year-old kids, as soon as they can lift a brick, they're coming out to chuck, chuck them at you. And it, it, it might not sound, um, okay, the three-year-olds generally don't throw them very far, but the bloody teenagers do. And, and many people have been taken out, you know, seriously injured by a brick. Yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about bricks for, but anyway, the point is, is you are on, you know, you, you've got to be on your toes when you're driving through the R door. You've got to be on your toes anywhere in, in, in yeah. Republican areas. Um, and suddenly there was this massive clunk, like a metallic, loud clunk, something techy, military-like, right? Not good, basically. And something had dropped in between. I'm I'm facing this way. Obviously, L was was my oppo. He's looking the other way. Something had felt as if it had dropped down in between us, hit the floor, and when we looked down, this device was just whizzing around, and all this smoke was coming out of it. So one of the screams. Uh, chemical attack <laughs> is it such, yeah. something along whatever it was or or, or or gas 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 yeah or or um we literally in that moment none of we just knew something wasn't right right the driver pulls over on the edge of the road everyone bomb bursts out the vehicle <laughs> and then uh, i think it was jock walked up and went it's a fire extinguisher. <laughs> it was the fire extinguisher we had inside the cab. It dropped off its bracket. It landed upside down and pop, pop, pop the nut, you know, the, the pin yeah. on top. And it was spinning around. And um, that was quite funny. But that's the old, um, oh, I don't know the word for it, but that's the thing that any, any um, commando-like soldier who fancies himself as a bit of a scrapper, you don't want to have to deal with the NBC stuff, do you? The nuclear, biological and chemical. It is not fun going on any sort of patrol in that clothing, which is just, it's so hot inside, it's so thick. It's basically like wearing layers of charcoal, wasn't it? Yeah. Then you've got the respirator, you can't, you can hardly breathe with it on. And so everybody, when I was in, you know, when I served, you wanted to go on exercises, you wanted to let loads of rounds off, you wanted to go into combat or whatever it was. Everyone was more than happy when the umpires went, right, there's no NBC threat, you can get rid of all that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And we, we, as you say, Chris, you just can't breathe in it, can you? It's it's literally that hot and um, doing it for real in Afghanistan and Iraq in 50 degree temperature in Iraq, uh, carrying full kit and having to put that on. Um, yeah, it, that, that's why I laugh now when people say, oh, it's a hot day, it's 30 degrees, I can't do this and they're walking around in shorts and it's like fucking try putting full kit on boots, uh, NBC kit in 50 degree temperature when someone wants to kill you, then, then you'll know what heat and pressure is. We're a bit, I think the old school mentality of like, you know, roughy toughy soldiers is a bit deluded now, isn't it? Because 
in technology is just so massively increased that the notion that you'll go out on patrol, you know, on a fighting patrol and no one's going to see you and you, you know, you're going to try and engage the enemy and take them out. I'm not saying it's never going to happen. I'm not saying it's not happening as we speak, but more and more, the enemy's only got to have eyes in the sky. So if they're a modern enemy like you, I'm not talking about the enemy in the Middle East, who obviously haven't got the technology or haven't, haven't got all the technology at their disposal, but any, any enemy worth his salt is going to have, um, what's it, like infrared cameras. You know, they're going to see you coming a mile away. Um you know they can they can just take you out with one quick drone strike or one one miss one guided missile. Um, all they got to do is drop some some bloody gas on you, and that's you're screwed. Yeah, I think I think the theatre of war is just really going to change, Steve. Don't you? Yeah, I do. I completely agree. Um, I just think it is um, it, it's a very different sort of. Uh, army to what what I went in uh, and my mates have told me that um, that they said I probably wouldn't like the way that it is now um, and I, I guess some things did need to change and I can see why they're having to adapt because of uh, like you say it's a very different threat than um, that arm or arm combat than someone who being clever and putting a drone up in the sky it's like um, how, how do you deal with that and, and also in um, one of my good friends was killed. Um, uh, he was a sergeant and he was taken out by an IED, command detonated IED. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, that basically means somebody physically pressed the button of an improvised explosive device and uh, just killed him instantly. And um, they, they've got really smart with that stuff. Um, it's it, it's it's so difficult to how can you, you you prep from that? They're watching your they're watching your patrols. They know how you move. They know where the leaders are, um, and they just get very smart to how we operate, how we move, um, the route you're taking, and it's just so easy for them to uh, set up an explosive device when you come near a bridge or a, or anything like that. It's just that that was the reason for me getting out. Um, I was meant to go back to Afghanistan again and my daughter had just been born and I'd just lost my mate and I just thought this this isn't for me now it's it's just becoming a very a very different war and I, I just knew that that was my time up and uh, anyone who's serving um, I've got massive respect because uh, what, yeah. uh, what happened to your mate Steve if, we, if, if I may ask uh, it was um, a command detonated uh, oh. IED, yeah. So um, they the basically just watched them patrolling and uh, they were crossing over a bridge and when, when they got to that bridge, um, they, de they detonated at, at exactly that time they needed to to take out the, uh, the recce sergeant, which, uh, which he was. Um, and, and like I said, one of my other good mates who's still serving now, actually, he's a warrant officer. He's just been commissioned. And uh, he was in a situation where uh, uh, he, he had to go or actually react to go to this situation. And again, an IED had been um, had killed a couple of the lads, but they'd set up um, a series of, of other explosives for when they extracted and ran out of that area that they would then take out the rest of the group and they were all at head height um, attached to the buildings, which would have just automatically just cling took the heads off all, all of the guys that are, are walking past. And fortunately th there was a malfunction what the, um, when the uh, uh, EOD guys had gone in our engineer specialists to uh to have a look at the scene and stuff like that. There was a secondary device that would have took out the rest of the section and it just, it malfunctioned and hadn't gone off. Otherwise, uh, there'd have been probably six, seven other soldiers that had lost their heads because uh, they were perfectly lined up at head height to, uh, to take out the rest of the section as well.
Yeah, secondary devices are famous, aren't they, for causing way more carnage than the first? Yeah. They usually cite them in a place where when you're dealing with the first incident, everyone's going to camp here, you know, set up camp here to set up the control center or the command center. And of course, the enemy's not stupid. They know that you're probably going to set up there. So they put another device in. And um, yeah, this is the this is why war isn't nice, mate, isn't it? No, absolutely. Uh, I, I always remember another thing, Chris, and you triggered that there when you were on about it was um, with the secondary devices and uh, explosives. I, I remember being in Afghanistan and our route from our tents to our to the cookhouse We'd been walking that route for probably six weeks at least, every day, probably, um, I don't know, 200-ish 200, 200 soldiers had walked this exact route from the tents to the cookhouse every day, the camp that we'd set up in Afghanistan. Um, and one of the particular days, there was a, a real big explosion and everyone was like, kind of, shit, what's happened there? Uh, we were out repairing one of the schools at the time and uh, two guys, they were both foreign. I think they were, um, I think they were German off the top of my head. Um, there'd been a device underneath the, uh, the floor, which um, apparently had been from the war, they reckon, when they'd been battling with the Russians. And it had just never, ever, um, it had just been planted there. And as we'd walked over and over for, for a couple of months, it's probably been there for 10, 10 years or something like that. And eventually the ground got unsettled and, and it just went off wow. um, and killed these two guys. But I'd walked that path. God, we, we, we walked that path three, four times a day um, for six weeks. And it was just that, that look of um, there were the, the, the ones where the ground was obviously just unsettling, putting more pressure, more pressure on the, the pressure plate. And eventually it just went off and... Uh, killed them both and uh, watching them coffins going back and, and being flown back home and being stood there and just thinking, fucking hell, that, that, that could have been me. It could have been any one of us. Um, and, and just knowing how helpless you are in situations like that, you're looking at the ground and thinking there could be more of them any, anywhere at all that I'm walking here right now. And like you say, that, that that's what triggered it when you say war's not fun. Um, it's very real and um, and a lot of the time you, you've got a great army around you, but you're absolutely sitting ducks, you're helpless in a lot of situations. Is it hard that, uh, I might sound like I'm asking a, a, a stupid question for our friends at home, it's just that everyone deals with grief differently everyone justifies it or rationalize it in their head and that's their their coping mechanism i'm guessing some some mechanisms work better than others and probably some mechanisms are just not helpful at all so i'm thinking about the you know you get some people they just want to cry in their beard the rest of their life and that's a, my opinion of that is that's not honoring the dead and it's not it's not getting out and smashing your, you know, your one life, right? Yeah. But how did you find it, Steve, to, lo to lose a, 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 a friend? Uh, I think that that was probably one of the hardest things when I found out about that. Um, for myself, <clears throat> I struggled in Iraq the first time in 2003. And um, it was more, it wasn't so much what we, what we seen. Um, I never once really particularly thought that my life was, was at risk. It was, it was always kind of shit that was close. Um, but I was never sort of in a situation where I thought, um, I I'm going to lose my life here. That didn't go through my head. Why I really struggled was because of the, the heat, the temperature, um, and all of the guys on camp had sickness and diarrhea. Um, which probably sounds bizarre that you're out in war, people are trying to kill you with missiles. And the stress came from being sick because what actually happened to me, because I lost so much weight, it went round camp constantly. You had sickness and diarrhea. 
you got rid of it, you got better, and within 24 hours, you had it back again because we were having to purify our own water. We, we, we only had two litres of water a day um, for the first weeks until all of the supplies come in. And you had no way to wash, no way to shower. That, that two litres of water, you were drinking it. So hygiene just went out, out, the, out the water completely. And um, everyone was just sick. Uh, constantly and I lost that much weight mentally it took me back to being that kid again of um, this small skinny kid um, I came back from that tour there's pictures of me and I'm, I'm I think I dropped back into like nine stone 13 or something like that I dropped just below the 10 stone mark and that had an effect on me more because of my insecurities as a as a kid that um, I'd gone out there, this, this big, strong uh, lad who was fit, physical training instructor, and I was now turning back into this weak, skinny, uh, frail kid where my insecurities were. And that's what I struggled with more than anything. Um, and I got PTSD 10 years after serving, um, uh, after serving in Iraq the first time. It was 2013. I'd been out the army three years. And uh, again, it was a, a really bizarre thing that triggered it off. And I can pinpoint it exactly now. It was my granddad's death. And uh, my granddad had died. And because I'd been very close, brought up by my grandparents. And in the army, as you know, you're, you're, I was always taught that it's weak to show your emotions. Um, and you, you didn't cry. You didn't. There was no time for crying. It was just get on with stuff. And um because I treat my granddad's death the same and just sort of buried it all to try and forget about it, um, it caught up with me. And um, I ended up seeing a, a psychologist, uh, a specialist in the army. And uh, what she said to me was, because I'd had this trauma in 2003 and never dealt with it, and this has now happened, the subconscious mind has brought it back to the surface again. Mm -hmm. um, and I was having dreams. My, what my mind had done, it was quite uh, weird how this had happened, was when I came out of the army around 2010, I read a story in the army and, and it really, really affected me. And you'll probably know this story. And it was um, four military police were, were trapped and uh, they basically ran out of ammunition. And I read that story and they were caught by the Taliban and their heads were cut off. Um, and, and this was in the papers and stuff like that. And they were, they were publicly drove around with the heads on the back of the wagons and all that. And I remember reading that story and just thinking, fucking hell, like people think of stress I couldn't think of anything worse at all of being with three of your mates coming under attack when you're not expecting it and realising you've run out of ammunition and you are now literally minutes away from your head being cut off and stuck on your back. And that's exactly what they've done. And I read that story and it had a real impact on me. Of I went there, I took myself there and imagined it. And because I'd done that, I started having these dreams that I was uh, one of these guys that had run out of ammunition and that never happened to me. I was never in a situation like that at all. I'd just read this in the paper and because of the trauma I'd had in Iraq and my granddad's death, my, my, my body just wanted to release it and, and it brought me this immense worst nightmare I've ever had. And uh, a week later, I had exactly the same dream again, that I'm, I'm, I'm in this small group of people. I've run out of ammunition. And that got to every three days, two days, every night, three, four times a night, till eventually I cracked. I, I literally broke. And um, I had to see a, a psychologist. And um, that, that therapy work was, was massive for me. Um, it completely changed me. It allowed me to to get rid of all that crap I'd stored for 12 years. And, and probably as a kid, all of that stuff from, from my dad, um, um, being tough with me, throwing spades at me, throwing padlocks at me, um, and forcing me to go out on my bike, 
all, all of the stuff in the army, the whole lot just came up. Uh, and, and I remember in them sessions, and I'm, I'm strong enough to admit that, I cried and cried my eyes out in every one of those sessions with that therapist um, until it all came out. Um, but off the back of that, my results, I, I remember the fourth session walking out of there and just thinking, I, there was physically, I could feel a weight lifted off my shoulders um, as if I'd just released it all. And it was um, was kind of like, now I'm gonna really, uh, I'm gonna really get some results now that this shit's out the way. And, um, that that for me, this is why I say to people, if you're having any sort of trauma, do not think it's weak to go speak to someone because that that woman literally changed my life, and um, I wouldn't be where I am now, and and I wouldn't be getting the results that I am if I hadn't gone and seen that therapist. So. Uh, for me, anybody, if they do watch this at all, reach out, speak to somebody. Yes, exactly. Steve, just one second. Did you get any rounds down during your your all, all your time in these different theatres, Steve? No, I didn't. I um, I was. Uh, it always felt like I was at the other end of it, where you couldn't really do anything about it. It was. Um, Certainly in Afghanistan, um, they, they didn't want to really make contact with you. It was uh, it was all done from from range with um, with missiles. Um, was was the majority of attacks. Um, you'd quite often hear if you were travelling about and stuff like that. There was a couple of times when I was outside and we were repairing the schools, and there, there was gunshots fired at you, um, but there were just pot shots. There were people taking the odd shots and um, to even know where it came from was, was just virtually impossible. And um, I found the same in Iraq, to be honest, it was um, any sort of threats were, uh, were, were at distance. Um, one of our claim to fame with, with, the, with the Iraq war, Telic one was that entire war couldn't start until my uh, troop, uh, had finished building the concrete pads for the um, uh, for the for, for our planes to land on because um, it was obviously just desert land and one of our roles as engineers was building the uh, concrete pads. I've gone and forgot the actual plane now. It's the one that can go up and down. What is it? Um, it's a plane, but it can fly like an helicopter where it turns. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm not that technical-minded <clears throat> these days, but I know exactly the one you're on about. Yeah, I've, I've gone and had a head blank, but basically, we, uh, I mean, that, that was one of the main planes we were using, and we were working 18-hour days. Um, when, we, when we finished that last concrete pad uh, that night, all, all of the planes came in, all of the... Um, um, all, all the American jets and everything like that, they were all landing on these pads. And um, we, we declared war. As soon as we got that pad finished, we declared war. And I remember that first night, uh, probably about 20 odd jets, um, some of them with the, uh, the Tomahawk missiles, which were a million pound of missile attached to them all going out, all coming back in empty, just one after another, after another, after another, just in a loop, just going out, um, obviously uh, just taking out all the major buildings and, and stuff like that and uh, coming back and reloading and just going back out again. And it was just one after another, after another. So was what that was like on the other end, God knows. Was it the uh, Osprey? Was that the one? No, it wasn't. No, um, if you said it, I'll know it. Yeah, somebody, if you're watching, put it in the comments for us. Enlighten us all. Um, yes. Let's let's come on to um, your Iron Man stuff, Steve. And I'm guessing it's this kind of mindset that that is also probably ties in very much with with your business yeah is that how, how did you get from the military um well into either into the business or the iron man which, which came first 
So I, I actually set up my property business while I was in the military. Um, I started buying properties. One of the things my dad always drummed into me was um, to save money. Um, he's never particularly been a businessman or an entrepreneur, but he's always been a, a sort of safe, put your money into things, save some of it for a rainy day. And he always drummed that into me as from a kid. <clears throat> and um, I started to make, obviously, excess money in the army. You're going to Afghan Iraq, you can't spend anything. So I started to put it into uh, standard life uh, policies. And then I got to a point where um, I, I was coming back from tour and I'd have sort of five, six grand um, just sat in the bank. And that was building up. And uh, I, I eventually, I bought my first property, uh, which went up in value. And then 2006, I started buying more properties. Um, I'd seen how much my own house had gone up. And I just thought, if I could get a few of these, this would be a great pension. And uh, I started building that up for the last four years before I, uh, before I came out. And then... Um, Coming out in 2010, just before my 12-year point, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd, uh, I'd not done a lot of running. So I came out and because I was extremely fit, because I was a PEI and um, had been obviously a past P company, I actually said I don't care if I never run ever again. I think I just got that sick of uh, running, tabbing, being thrashed as a kid. Uh, I had a big passion for the gym and I just thought, right, I'll train in the gym. And that's what I did. And I put some real size and I went up to 14 stone, which for my height and my body weight, um, I was very muscular and that was my life. It was just eating, training. Um, I was immensely strong. I'd really sort of built my body up. And then uh, probably after about seven years of being out, I had an itch and I just kept thinking about more cardio stuff. I wonder what I'm capable of. I wonder if I could still live up to the reputation that I had in the military of, um, uh, I was a horrible PEI in terms of thrashing the lads. I used to love thrashing the lads. I love thrashing myself and people used to say that I was uh, a bit sick that way. And it was just in the back of my head, what am I still capable of doing? And um, I, I sort of thought about it for about a year, didn't really do anything. Um, and then I started kind of asking the question to a few people, um, thinking about maybe doing a challenge and people were like, why don't you do a marathon with me? And I just said, no disrespect, I can't get motivated for, for doing a marathon. And people said, do the course to coast, it's 120 mile on the bike. And again, it just, I'm not disrespecting anyone who's done those things because the great life achievements and it's all about our own goals, what we're doing, but they just weren't big enough to motivate me. And um, last year, that itch just got bigger and bigger. And I remember just thinking, I want to go do something that's going to really push me. Some of that, I don't know if I can do, as crazy as that sounds. That's what's always fascinated me, doing the things that I might fail. And uh, I went and spoke with a probably five of my mates, guys who I really respect, ex-commandos, ex-paras, um, ex-SES, and uh, just kind of said, look, I'm, I'm wanting to do a challenge. I want it to be somewhat hard. And every single one of them, this was the crazy thing, all said, you need to go do an Ironman. And uh, I wasn't expecting that. And I knew what an Ironman was. Um, and and I, to be honest, I, I knew it was anyone who trained or done an Ironman was obviously at a serious level of fitness, the level of commitment and mental strength that must have to do that. What surprised me was every single one of those that I spoke to individually all said to me, if you want a real test, you need to do an Ironman. Um, and that's where I thought, right, okay. Um, obviously, uh, this is the event which uh, people measure that level of commitment, fitness, strength. So I decided to do two. I'd never done one. I'd never even done a half before. And I decided to do two back to back with no sleep, um, just straight through continuous. And uh, I remember announcing it on Facebook saying 16 weeks time, it pr practically was, I'm gonna go do this double Ironman that was from scratch. I'd done no running. 
Um, I'd never swam more than 400 metres. I, I was immensely conditioned. I trained four or five times a week. I ate healthy. I pushed myself really hard in the gym. Um, but in terms of fitness, I hadn't done any, hardly anything at all since uh, leaving the army. And um, I put it on Facebook and a lot of people just said, you're crazy, you're too old, you won't be able to do that now, you've not done fitness for this long, you're living in a dream world. And uh, one of the guys I used to serve with, we were both corporals together, um, he reached out to me, he was one of the army, he was on the army triathlon team as a coach. And he, he, he reached out to me and said, look, are you serious about doing this? He, he passed P company as well. He knew I was a fit lad. He knew mentally that I was determined to do it. And he just said, if you're interested, I'll, I'll train you to get you there. I'll give you the training program. But I think you need to put it back a year. And I said, no, no, I'm doing it in 16 weeks. And he just said, right, okay. Um, it's your call, but the training's going to be immense if I've got to get you to that level in 16 weeks. And uh, it was, um, I, I, I built up within, within the first two weeks. This was before I worked with him because he kicked my ass about this. I went out and ran 20 mile uh, within the first two weeks from, from nothing. Um, and then he took over the program and, and said, we're going to steady that down a bit. We don't want to be doing anything crazy or get injuries. And he created the training program. And I was probably about four weeks into the training. Yeah, about four weeks into the training. And my brother rang me one morning and just said, um, mum's not well, I've taken her to hospital. Um, and I was just about to go out for my run. I think I had a 10 mile run to do. And uh, I came back in. And um, I'd had a couple of missed calls off him. I rang him back and he said, Mam's took a turn for the worst. Um, it's not looking good. And she was 62 years old. It came as a, as a mega shock. And um, within literally an hour, they'd uh, put her on life support. And uh, for, for seven days, she was on life support. I was training at the same time, reporting back to my two younger brothers and uh, at day seven, the, the, the doctor I'd been speaking to daily just said, there's nothing more we can do. We're going to turn off the life support. And um, we were invited to go into the, to the hospital and sort of say our last goodbyes. And um, they, they obviously pulled the plug on the life support. And she, she died within minutes of them, of them doing that. And uh, I said at the funeral that I'll dedicate that. I'll now dedicate this double iron man world record to my mum and um i give myself no way out it was um I, again i'm a big believer in burning your burning your boats um and, and giving yourself no way out and, and that's what i said i'd do and uh that was that was difficult it was a hard time to uh, to, to face that my mum was only 62 years old and um i did the iron man uh, the date came and obviously uh, to do that two back to back and um, got through the first one. And I always remember my mate saying to me, who one of the guys had done a lot of Ironman distances. And uh, he said to me, I cannot think of anything worse than doing an Ironman and then having to do another one straight after it. He said, because I know you're a fit lad. I know you're determined but he said to do an Ironman, it's going to take more out of you than you, than you realize. It's extreme doing the three different events. The, for anyone who doesn't know, the 2.4 mile open water swim, 112 mile on the bike, and then run a full marathon. And then to do another one straight after that, um, he just said, I couldn't think of anything worse. And I, I guess I didn't listen to him. Um, until I finished the first one or till I got towards the end of the first one and I was completely wiped out. I was back to that sort of level. I was on that log on P company and like, shit, I now have a, a whole different level of respect for, for somebody who's done an Ironman. And uh, for the first time in a lot of years, because I, I don't get negative thoughts, I'm, I'm very much believing what I'm, I'm capable of doing. And I, for the first time, started to look in the mirror 
um, when I came in for a pee break and I just thought I'd not lost the desire, but I started to question, was I capable of doing this? And it was like, shit, I've got to do this all over again now. And it was 12 o'clock at night. It was in October. It was cold and it had started to rain. It was pitch black. And I had to go back into the river again to, to start over again. Which, which river was that, Steve? The River Tees. So um, in Yam, I, I, I got into the river in Yam and uh, got out at Preston Park. Um, and uh, it was weird, Chris, because we, we, we started this whole interview. We're talking about energy and uh, being in flow. And uh, I remember getting back in the minibus. And you'll remember this. Uh, I, I laugh at this now. And, and again, in a sick way. I got back into that minibus to start the second Ironman and uh, we got into Yarm. As I say, it was cold. It was October. Um, it was dark. It was raining. And when they opened the doors for the minibus and I'm about to just go start a second Ironman, no morale at all at this point was kind of like, shit, I do not want to do this. It reminded me of uh, being on exercise in the army when uh, the first time you get off the back of a wagon and you're just about to start a, a seven day exercise and you know it's going to be shit, you know it's going to be cold, you know they've chose January to do it as a purpose to just make you cold. And I had that same feeling and I remember getting out the wagon and uh, out the minibus, got to the side of the river and I remember just looking up to the sky and I remember just thinking, mum, if you're there just to... Uh, Right now, I could do with some support, some strength, um, and a, just a fucking huge... I, I've only ever seen two others in my life, and a huge shooting star just literally went across the sky and fucking lit the entire sky up. Um, and my swimming coach was with me because he was swimming with me for safety. Um, he just went, look at that, if that's not a sign. And, and he knew the situation with my mum. He knew why I was doing it. Um, and I just cracked on. I got back in that freezing cold river and uh, I just grinded it out. It took me an extra half an hour to do the, the second swim. Warwick did the first one. I got on the bike. I was immensely slow on the second one. It took me something like 10 hours to do the bike. Um, and then I had to run the marathon again. Um, and bizarrely, my body just kicked back in again. And I ended up running the marathon, I think, 20 minutes quicker than what I'd run the first one. Um, and when I finished it, I actually felt quite, um, I, I felt quite fresh as if I could do, um, do more. And uh, that's the reason why now I'm going to attempt to do four back-to-back -back with no sleep. Bloody hell. Right, let's peel back a bit because the, 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 the adventurous side of me wants to ask you some techie kind of questions so what um god just a reminder for people watching it i i'm all over the screen today i get that it's because i got vertigo i can't just stare at steve talking you know my guests like i normally would so apologies uh, that's why i've been popping um seasickness <laughs> tablets <clears throat> so yeah if you see me throw up guys that's um that's why. <laughs> um, yes. So when I when I did my quadruple Ironman distance triathlon, Steve, right? Um, I'll say distance triathlon, meaning I didn't do my swim in open water. I tried to do it in a Lido pool, which is an outdoor cold water, uh, salt water swimming pool. Yeah. And... <clears throat> I'd spent 500 quid on the best wetsuit I could find, which was a zone three. Um, it was the latest one. It was very cool looking graphite gray with an orange, you know, stuff and clever stuff on the wrists. Yeah. Apparently it's supposed to tell you like how your stroke, you know, it's supposed to help you refine your stroke. And Here's where having a plan B can be really freaking good because I got to about four mile 
and I started going down with hypothermia, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm, I can be skinniest at the best of times, right? When I go into an event, I've usually lost about two stone in, in about, about a month. I lose two stone in, I can do it really quickly. Um, and so I might enter an event at under 10 stone and I'm five foot eight, right? Just to give people an idea. And my body literally had no, not enough fat to keep yeah. warm. And these wetsuits, they're not like you'd wear if you were scuba diving 40 meters down in winter, or you wear some big sort of seven mil wetsuit. These yeah. are, they're five mil on, 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 on your body, five mil on, on, on your thighs. The rest is all three mil and some of it, isn't even wetsuit material. It's like this stretchy, like one millimetre fabric, right? So you can, the idea being you can move your arms easier. Well, what I found is, is that using this kind of wetsuit in the summer was fine. Um, did my first Olympic triathlon in the summer. Eight weeks later, quite funny actually I came I came last on the Olympic triathlon <laughs> and then I said all right in eight weeks time I'll do a quadruple Ironman then right so I, it, it things went in my favor so for a start the run which funnily enough was this this run and it's not why I wore this shirt but it was the Robin Hood 100 mile ultra was in a week's time right right so it or it was in six days time so i started my quadruple distance ironman with the kind of goal of getting it done in a week because i had the 100 mile run at the end of it it was 108 mile run in the end um um and so yeah i got in the water and i started going down mate you know i started going down and and it was there is it wasn't about like being tough and tough and it, no i i would have have stayed in there i'd have yeah. shivered myself to death right i'd have lost consciousness and um so i went to plan b i went to the indoor pool and i finished off my 10 mile swim or my nine mile swim whatever it was in the indoor pool and it all because when you do your own vents there aren't any like rules on you obviously in a proper iron man it's got to be in 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 open water yeah although i have seen like these 10 decker iron men's done and they they do the swim in the swimming pool yeah um, i've seen that yeah but i'm fascinated to know what wetsuit you had then because you, you're getting in the water in october it's going to be bitter it was uh i've gone and forgot its name now um, it was a 3.6 mil, um, I've gone and forgot its name, um, anyway, it'll come back to me, it was a 3.6 mil, um, I was fortunate in some ways because I'd been on holiday, I'd been in Turkey in August and I was doing the event in October and one of my mates, he's, um, He's a very seasoned open water swimmer. And he said to me, you are fucking crazy swimming in October. That open water swimming stops in September. Um, and he said, I I've swam in them conditions. He said, but you're going to struggle. He said, I'm, I'm conditioned to swim at them, them, them sort of temperatures. Um, and the temperatures dropped to sort of seven degrees. Um, I remember coming back from Turkey and we were meant to do a, I think it was a 1.2 mile swim. We got in the water and I couldn't breathe. I literally, it, again, it wasn't down to me being weak. It wasn't a matter of being able to crack on. I physically couldn't breathe. I was just that cold and I'd had cold water shock. Um, and my swim coach and my head coach had both, they, they were concerned. I was, I was very concerned because I thought, shit, I've got now got a real problem here. Um, their work concern, they just said, look, you, you, you've just come back from Turkey. It was red hot. Uh, you, you'll, you'll condition to it, um, kind of man up because the both, uh, the both ex, uh, well, well the both still serving actually, uh, one's got his commission and the other one's just about to get his commission. And they both told me a man up, um, in a nutshell. 
Um, but when I did the second swim, it was the same. It was so cold. Um, it was just draining me massively. Um, the uh, the wetsuit was a hub. That's what it was. It was a hub. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, going back into that water the second time, um, I, I was just like the same as what you're saying. I was just completely drained. That 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 the cold temperature um, massively took it out of my body. Um, and by that point, I'd already done over 140 mile. Um, so yeah, I, I know what that feeling's like. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I'm just pleased that this wetsuit kept you alive then, Steve, obviously. It, it fended off the hypothermia, which is what it's supposed to do, right? Yeah, well, what, what I'd done was, this, this was a, a tip from my head coach. So I had this 3.6 mil, uh, 3.2, I think it was, 3.2 mil uh, wetsuit. Uh, what I'd done was I put a 2 mil uh, neoprene vest underneath and a set of two mil shorts as well. And then I had seven mil socks uh, and five mil gloves. Um, and then I had for my, I had my um, a zone uh, head, um, head cap on. And then I also had a, a thermal, I think it was three mil um, over the top of that as well. Um, and, and it was still just cutting through. It, it, it was fucking freezing and that's the only way I can put it. Did it help? Um, I mean, um, did you go with the current in the river? Did that yeah, help? I went with the current. It, it was a very, the, the route that I was swimming is a very, very mild, it, it was almost non-existent, but there was a, there was a slight current, um, which definitely helped me uh, a little bit. And we, we looked for those advantages. Um, the world record that I'd done, um, I don't dispute for a minute that any of the guys that are doing world record triath triathlons and stuff like that, they'd have been able to do what I'd done. It was just the configuration that i uh, done a full Ironman. When people are doing doubles without a rest, without having the overnight sleep, if they do a double, they'll do... Uh, double swim, double bike, double run. Uh, and often, as you say, the swims are done in a swimming pool. Um, because it was an open water swim, swim, bike, run, and then starting the whole thing over, swim, bike, run, it had never been done before in, in open water, um, back to back like that. Um, had never been recorded. So we, we looked at it and thought, it's going to be harder to do it that way because I've then got, six different transitions basically i'm having to do the the swim the bike the run and then swim bike run and all of them changes of the kit um the travel back to the river again which was practically another hour all of that was going to add time on to, to to me not being asleep and um the whole thing from start to finish with the travel and the um the transitions was 37 hours in total so um, we never went for speed. Um, I've never particularly been quick, even when I was in the army as a physical training instructor. I was never particularly quick at doing a mile and a half, but I was immensely good at endurance, being able to, to continue at a, a solid pace. But I could break people around me that always that always give in before I did. Um, so we thought play our strengths. Um, the marathon wasn't particularly at a quick pace. I think I did it in five, five and a bit hours or something like that. Um, the first bike was about seven and a half hours. Second one was 10 hours. Um, swim times were, I think it was one hour 20 for my first one. And then one hour 50 for my second swim. Um, so not particularly quick times. Um, it was more about just that endurance and going back into that cold water and that ability to do two like that without any sleep was um, what we done. And as I say, I de dedicated that to my mum's death. I got a world record in the process. Um, and the most amazing thing was I raised £27,000 for mental health, which... Uh, is something close to my heart and that money's been very well received by people. Um, so uh, yeah, 
um, overall, it was a, a great experience. Awesome. What um, what bike did you have, Steve? I had a, a giant. It was it was my dad's old bike, so my dad's a fanatical bike rider. Um, he's still massively into his fitness, so he did both of the 112 mile bike rides with me. And um, and he's 65 years old to put it in perspective, and and did both of the bike rides with me. He led the way, and I tucked in behind him again. It was tactical um, to keep me out of the wind. He, he, he practically led um, both of those. My, my coach done um, some stints as well, um, and I just tucked in behind basically. And I had one of his old bikes, which I'd bought a few years prior which was a giant propel, uh, a really hard setup of a bike. And um, it was good in, in, in the respect of, um, it just glides, it's just so light. It's all, um, uh, what's it's, the word? Um, mate, I've got a giant propel. All <clears throat> oh, right, okay. Propel. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to make sure that we're, we're talking about the same bike. It's got quite an interesting head setup, isn't it? It's um yeah can't really explain it but I, I had a i had an old racing bike that i used when i did the um the uh, olympic triathlon right the olympic distance triathlon and the bloody difference between that thing and my carbon fiber bike yeah was just oh my god the car, the Gian, it's like it, it's like a racehorse. It just wants to go on its own. Yeah. You know, you can carve up any hill. Where, whereas the the old aluminium bike, it was, you know, it was quite some workout to get up a steep hill. Yeah, there's a big um, difference, isn't there? Yeah, just amazing. I, I got on it, um, and I started. I remember when I rode it for the first time, I got about 500 meters and I still couldn't work out how was this, was it how to change gear? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, where's the gear levers? Can't, and I'm just playing with stuff. And then I realized it's in the brake. Yeah. Um, you know, it's in the brake, uh, whatever you call them, the brake levers. <sighs> yeah, it's incredible. How, um, and, let me so I'm just moving stuff around here so I don't spin out too much. Um, uh, and it's not easy cycling that distance, Steve, is it? I I thought it was going to oh. be, yeah, I just get on the bike and do it, but no, I found, um, bear in mind, I had to do 450 miles and I had four days to do it in so, uh. 110 mile a day and the first day I did that little bit extra but I was going flat out from sort of six in the morning until I don't know sometimes like 10 at night yeah just and I'm not I'm not a good cyclist or anything I find it really quite hard if I was honest when I look at the timings when I when people talk about timings I realise I'm well slower than most cyclists. I don't know why I'm done if it's weight or what it is, but I was still having to go at it all day long. It wasn't like I was having a two hour lunch break or anything. You know, I was grabbing a pasty and cycling along, eating it just to keep going. Yeah. I was cycling anywhere I could think of. So we got a very beautiful reservoir near us and it's four miles all the way round. So I just do you know, 12, 12 times around that until I got bored and then I'd fuck off to somewhere else. And, and I'm just checking the tracker all the time going, oh, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Um, it's not easy, is it? Nah, it's, people asked me um, which was the worst out of the three events and they were all bad for their own reasons. Um, the swim, because of the cold water, the, the, the swim would have been a gift um, in some respects, um, if the weather had been nice, but the swim was brutal. I was just freezing cold right through to the bone where I could hardly lift my arms up, my technique and everything. I was rather than like 
nice stroke. I was kind of swimming like this and arms coming over the side and really fatigued, really cold weather. Um, the bike was just horrible because it just goes on forever and ever and ever and just doesn't seem to ever end. Um, and then the run was hard just because of the, the, the sheer compounding of, of running uh, 52 miles um, after you've done all those other, those other stuff. The running just, uh, I find the running takes the most out of you. Um, but the bike was horrible. And, and, and the thing with the bike as well, and I still have it now, because you're using the giant propel, it was great because it wants to glide. But because the setup's so hard and there's no suspension, I, I had a pain. I've never had it a, uh. along both of the fronts of my arms because of the vibration of the bike being so solid. Um, I was on the bike for best part of 18 hours in total. And um, I, I still have it now where I've lost the feeling in these, the, these end fingers here in my little finger and, and the end. And I had that really bad for the first four weeks after the event where I couldn't feel them at all. Um, and I've still got it a bit now. I guess it's just like white finger, that vibration of doing 224 mile on a bike. Um, guess our body's just uh, not meant to do stuff like that. Well, just a, an interesting point then, and I hope this helps anyone listening. When I did the 108 mile run, which just turned into an, an epic. <laughs> anyway, um, I lost all the feeling in my toes, right? In fact, I'm going to chuck a couple of things in here for our for our runner type people listening. Right, I bought my 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 normal size training shoe. I bought some Asics. They, they, these things are never cheap these days. You always pay 120 yeah. quid for a pair of shoes now, right? 100 quid. If you get some in a sale, you might be lucky and get them for 70, right? But they're not cheap. Bought these Asics in a seven, which is what I am. Silly mistake, right? Should have got. A size bigger if not especially as i was running in the summer right my feet swelled and right from about mile 10 i started to get blisters well wow. um <clears throat> what i what i did when i ran 200 miles in five days at christmas i bought uh brooks they do an extra wide setting and my feet are fairly wide um, I didn't buy a size bigger, but I just got the extra wide and I wore these new double skin socks that have just come on the market or they they're fairly recent. They're like they're socks, but they've got two two walls like that. And um, because that takes the friction, it stops your feet taking the friction. So you, so I ran 200 miles, Steve, didn't get a single blister, not didn't get any foot foot pain, discomfort, um, got got Achilles stuff, which is just bloody awful. Yeah, I've got that as well. That's what I had Achilles off, off the back of mine. I never had it before, right? I had it in training, but that's because the boot used to push into the back of my Achilles where it had all the boot had all dried out, right? This 200 miler chucked up loads of stuff I just never, I'd never even considered, you know? My body was no way like ready to run that. Um, it was just injury piling on top of injury. Even in the last half mile, I tore my bloody calf muscle, right? And that feels like it. It, it just feels like um, like an, a, a rubber band snapping, right? You, yeah. It's almost like you can hear it. Um, by that time, I was so hacked off of it. I just, I just, I just literally ran through that pain i just didn't even think about it um but um what was i saying that oh yeah after that 108 miler i'd lost all the feeling in my left toes right I, so from the fourth toe across to the little toe all of that gradually progressing into feeling nothing at all and i thought it was something you know to do with a shoe right and it wasn't until one of my followers or subscribers pointed out, no, Chris, it's probably your back, right? Because uh, I've had, you know, I've had back problems. I've had um, a discectomy and all this kind of stuff. 
what I found out, Steve, is if I get dehydrated, which I tend to be quite a lot of the time, I'm just not a person that drinks a lot of water. Um, I lose the feeling in my toes. And if I had to guess, I'd say that when you get dehydrated, your body will take liquid from your discs. So right. they shrink, so they shrink. So your spine shrinks and it's putting pressure. The possibility is it's putting pressure on a nerve, right? That's yeah. why, I, that's why I lose the feeling in my, um, in my toes. So when I start to lose the feeling in my toes, I just go and get a pint of, you know, yeah. a pint of water or, or put a bit of juice in it or something. And, um, and it, it, it goes away again. Crazy. But, yeah, but the, the hand thing, that's that's quite a common thing in cyclists, isn't it? I don't know, to be honest. Um, it, it's never something that I've experienced, but saying that I've never I'd never cycled at that that the most I'd ever done was 130 mile, which I'd done in one of my training sessions building up towards it. Um but yeah, to, to, when you're starting to do 224 mile and you've had no sleep and you've done that a marathon and best part of by then five miles of swimming, um, obviously it starts to take its toll and, and it did. Um, but yeah, Achilles for me was, um, I've still got it now. So I'm now three months after the event and I've still not been able to shake it off. How how did that come around, and what did what did it feel like? It it, it happened on the the first marathon, and I was probably about twenty mile into the marathon, and it just started to feel a bit sore. And um, I had I had Achilles problems when I'd done P Company. Um, never had them any other time. Just when I'd done P Company, and anyway, it came back about the twenty mile point. I said to my head coach, my Achilles is hurting. We done a trainer swap, which we were doing regular anyway. And um, he he felt like it was um, down. I, I like wearing Adidas. Um, so I've got a, pe- a couple of pair of hockers. Um, but I also, I've always liked running an Adidas and, and he wasn't a big fan. And he, he kind of just said, I think it's them trainers. Um, I, I don't believe it was. I just think it was the, sh- the sheer the sheer amount of, of, of miles what I'd done by that point personally. Um, I then went back, I finished the first Ironman, started the second one and it started to play up a lot more on the bike. Um, the second bike, it was starting to hurt more and more. And when I'd done the second 112 mile on the bike and, and went to start running again, practically that whole second marathon, I was in pain. Um, there was a period from probably about the five mile, a 10 mile point, I was limping for best part of an hour. Um, and I ran the whole lot. I didn't, I didn't want to stop. Um, once I'd sort of got to the, the 14, 15 mile point, I started feeling better. I think probably the adrenaline of, of knowing I was coming to the end. There was a lot of people out on the streets. There was a lot of kids, um, a lot of families, the police were out beeping the horns, cars were beeping the horns, the fire engines were out beeping the horns. And I think all of that, that adrenaline took over and I stopped feeling it. Um, and I came to a really warm reception. Um, there was hundreds of people waiting for me to uh, to cross the line. It had all been sort of shot live into um, all of the local um, groups in my area. And there was... Um, a lot of people were watching it live and uh, I came to work like a really warm reception. Like I said, a lot of kids were out and um, people cheering and stuff like that. Cars beeping the horns and uh, the last lap that I'd done, the very last bit, I put a T-shirt on with rest in peace, ma'am, um, which was sort of the, the finale of the uh, the whole thing. And um we created a documentary off the back of that, which is on our YouTube channel. And that's, uh, it's had four awards already. Um, it's, it's, it's reached the final in three different awards for documentary of the year in, in international documentaries. Um, 
and that that's on my YouTube channel, which uh, we're hoping we're going to pick up a, a fairly major award for it. Brilliant. And what's your, what are your sort of, did you say you, your next plan is to do a quadruple? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the, the intention. Right now I've got to shake off these injuries. Um, but I finished the two and there was more in the tank. So there's, there's that question there of, can I do more? Um, might be a bit crazy, but I guess that's why I'm, the likes of people like me and you do what we do. Uh, it's that curiosity. Uh, you want to push yourself to a point where you might not be able to do it. And, and for me, that that's intriguing. That um, kind of excites me, that, that feeling of something may be able to beat me, but maybe it won't. Did you, did you have to take any painkillers, Steve? Yeah, on, on the second run, um, my, my feet were fine. Um, I, um, I got one blister on the second run and, and having army team around me, so mainly the guys around me were uh, my head coach, my swim coach were, were military guys, uh, past P company, um, the Dunayan mans themselves. So I, I had a really good team around me. Um, I, I, I felt pain on the side of my foot and I said, I think I've got a blister. <clears throat> um, we stopped on the next loop, whipped the socks off, um, and being military guys that dealt with it dead quick, stuck the needle in, um, squeezed the blood out, taped it up, um, and, and sent me straight back out. It was dealt with really quickly. Um, and I think that, that that really helped having military guys around me that they weren't flapping, they were mega calm throughout the whole thing. Even when I was having really low dips and I, it looked like I was completely gone, um, they were fine. They knew that I would sort of come back out of that at some point. And it was just a matter of um, keep moving forward. Um, and let's, we were going to talk about your homeless project, weren't we? I'm conscious not to forget that. Should we cover that now? Yeah. So um, the year before I'd done um, another project, which um, was I wanted to go out on the streets and, um, the, the reason for doing this, and I'd wanted to do it for five years prior, was I wanted to, I wanted to make the point that the importance of mindset and that it's only mindset that's stopping us from doing anything at all. So I wanted to go out on the, I went out on the streets in Leeds. I had no phone. I had no money. Um, and uh, I wanted to go live on the streets and I set myself a series of tasks. And the, the point I wanted to make was we can move out of our situation and prove wherever you are now, whoever's watching this, there's a better version of you and there's, there's, a, there's a better place. And I always say be grateful for where you are, but always have a desire for more. And I wanted to make the point that we can improve our current situation. Um. So I went to Leeds. Uh, my partner wanted me to have a mobile phone. I wasn't willing to do that. Um, so I went out there and um, I took heroin. So I wanted to, because I knew people would say, well, it's all right for you. you you're only out there for so long. And these people are on heavy addictive drugs. Uh, so I went and took heroin to get myself addicted to that. Um, and I remember that, the, the sort of first night of doing that, being in the car, and I, I was scared. Um, and it's not often I'm scared um, because people had said to me, um, one guy said something to me about a week before, and I fucking wish he hadn't because I thought, shit, I need to blank that out because he said to me, you've probably got the mental strength to do heroin and, and it not having any long-term impact and you being able to get back off it. But it can change the chemistry in your body and you may never never feel the way you do right now. And because I'm in such a good place, I thought, shit, um, I never really considered that. Um, I was already committed by that point. It was already happening. I thought, I'm, I'm not going to own that story. I'm just going to blank that out. And I remember that first night of being with a guy that we'd... Um, 
we'd sort of brought in who was a, an ex-heroin addict um, to do it. And, and he was sort of burning the heroin and that, that, that smell um, and, and doing that for the first time and that impact that it had on me, it just literally, it just wiped me out. Um, I was just gone. And uh, uh, the guy who uh, we done it with, Dean, who did all the media, um, you can see in them pictures, the, the, again, the documentaries on YouTube, and I'm, I'm just completely gone. Um, I had no desire to do anything at all. I just felt really warm and it felt really, it felt good. Um, and I've admitted that on the, on, on, on the, uh, the documentary that it was just this really warm, relaxed content feeling. And I can see why homeless people do it because I didn't feel cold. There wasn't sort of that thought of shit, I'm on the street. You were sort of in your own bubble, um, which I've now learned um, that the homeless people call uh, heroin this, um, the heroin blanket. They actually call it this, this blanket that it feels like you've got around you when you're doing the heroin. And um, I stayed on the streets. I, um, I slept in the doorways. I shared food with them. Um, our camera guy, Ding, he experienced it all as well, firsthand in terms of the drugs they were taking, watching them taking drugs, um, watching them buy them, the alcohol, <clears throat> begging for food, begging for money. I really got in there and I'd done the whole thing. And then uh, after we'd spoke to quite a lot of people and, and I made some really good friendships out there, uh, we got to a point where I was going to prove now that I could get back off it. And uh, I had to go, I'd grown a big beard, big scruffy beard, hair was all long. Um, so I had to go get a, a shave, my hair cut, new clothes, an apartment and a job all from scratch. Couldn't use any contacts, no CVs or anything like that. Um, Getting the haircut happened really quickly. So I went into the very first barbers. Um, I don't know if I just came across a good guy, but I just went in and I, uh, I had a hidden, hidden camera on and I just said to the guy, uh, I'm homeless. I want to turn my life around um, and I, I need somebody to clean me up. Is there any chance you could give me a, a shave and cut my hair? And I said, I've only got this money on me. And I think I had like about 50, 60 pence on me or something like that. And the guy said to us, look, I don't want any money, mate. He said, come back at two or three o'clock and uh, I've got a, a spare slot. I'll, I'll get you whipped up. And uh, went into the barbers, gave me a shave, cut all my hair off, smartened me up. I still had all of these smelly, dirty clothes on. And then I confessed to him afterwards that, Actually, I was um, quite a wealthy guy and uh, we give him £10,000 of business training for his, for his business, which he was absolutely over the moon with. Um, and I said to him, I'm after some clothes. Where could I get some? And he said, uh, I know somebody, I know there's a guy where I buy some clothes from. He's a really good guy. He might be willing to help you out. Um, we went to this particular place. And it was closed, so um, I went around a number of shops to try and get clothes. A lot of them just kicked me out because um, I, I was stinking. I had all of these dirty clothes on these dirty boots, and uh, a lot of people sort of um, didn't want me in there. <clears throat> um, and then uh, I went back to this place, and it had opened up again. And uh, I said to the guy, look, I'm, I'm homeless. I'm wanting to turn my life around. Uh, I've had a haircut and a shave off a guy who knows you. And um, he just said, yeah, I'll get, I'll get you sorted out, mate. He said, just go pick a few things that you want. Don't worry about the money. It's good to be able to help you. Um, and he let me pick some jeans, a shirt, um, a, a sort of sweet sort of old style jacket, which looks smart. Um, he only had a pair of seven shoes. So I had to take um, these size sevens was like a retro type um, clothing purse and they were too small for me. So I had to walk around with them crippling my feet. And then I had to go get um, a job in an apartment, which um, proved to be a lot harder than what I expected. I thought that 
I knew it was a numbers game. I thought if I knock on a hundred doors, someone's going to give me a job. It's as simple as that. Um, and we went door after door after door after door after door, and it just wasn't working. Um, I got offered a couple of part-time things, a uh, little bit of bar work, but straight away people were saying to me, have you got a bit of a reference? Uh, where have you come from? Have you got a phone number? And because I didn't have any of them things, it just shone through that I was lying. Um, and you could just sort of see that the, the summit doesn't stack up with this guy at all. And um, that was really, really difficult to the point where I was walking around, I was going into pubs, and just shouting, can I grab everyone's attention, please? Um, I'm homeless. I'm wanting to turn my life around. Somebody's given me a shave and, and they've given me these clothes. I'm after a job. Does anybody know of anything going? And people were just laughing at me. Um, and, and that was really difficult. And then uh, we found a, um, uh, a charity that were giving food out and um, spoke with those, got some free food and stuff like that. And um, I got talking to them and, and she, she was under the impression that I was homeless. I wasn't able to tell anyone. And uh, she took me to her house that night and said, look, you can stay here tonight. We'll get you sort of um, cleaned up, have a shower and stuff like that. Because although I had these new clothes on, um, I was still stinking. I'd been washing in sort of the local fountain and stuff like that. And uh, the next day she managed to... Uh, she said, look, I might be able to help you out. I know somebody whose house uh, that have rented it out has been used to grow drugs. If you're willing to clean it all out, um, she's willing to give you a place to stay free of charge for six months. And she'll also pay you for clearing it all out. And uh, I went to this house and you literally, you couldn't write it. Um, They'd been growing this cannabis farm in, inside this property and, and I had to clean it all out. And because there'd been a bit of a dispute, <clears throat> they'd left um, fish in the fridge um, and there was just maggots everywhere. It was the worst smell I've ever smelled in my life. And I had to gut the whole place out. And at the end of it, I obviously came clean and told them who I was. And uh, we offered to renovate our whole apartment. Um, I took my team of lads, my construction team down, and we done a full revamp on a on a property. So yeah, over, overall, it was um, it was an amazing experience. The biggest learns, and most people have got homeless people wrong, and I can say this from spending a week on the streets. Most of them want to be there. They don't want accommodation. When we offered them it, they didn't want it the same paying bills are stress. So um, all of the people that we spoke to were either alcoholics or on drugs. Every single one of them, there was only one of them who wasn't on drugs and he was an alcoholic. Um, they are targeted. So when they become homeless, the drug dealers, if they know someone's new on the street, they'll go give them heroin or spice free to get them addicted so they now come back to them um, and that's how they were sort of trapping them and keeping them on the streets some of them uh, had had jobs respectable people and probably wouldn't have stayed on the streets but because the uh, drug dealers had pinned them at this sort of lifestyle and i'm not blaming the drug dealers because obviously they'd got themselves in that situation in the first place but they, they were kind of stuck they were addicted to the drugs and um, they didn't want to change the lifestyle. Um, but the number one thing, I was never, ever out of food. I was never, ever out of uh, water. And the same as the guys that I met out there, the number one thing that they all wanted was somebody to just acknowledge them and speak to them. And I can completely second that because I sat there and people will walk past you, and even the ones that give you money, they'll kind of throw the money down. Nobody speaks to you. There's thousands of people walking past you. Nobody engages with you. And the amount of people that belittled me um, and said nasty things um, about me being homeless and a waste of space and things like that, it was absolutely shocking. And every person that I spoke to and interviewed 
had all been physically attacked, that had alcohol poured on them, that had been kicked in the sleeping bags. Um, just, just brutal. It was, it was a real eye opener. Um, but uh, again, it's had an impact on a lot of people's lives. And um, we've been nominated by the Gold Movie Awards for that documentary as well, which is also on my YouTube channel. Oh, blimey. What a thing to do. Well done, mate. Yeah, probably a bit crazy, some people, so. Yes, well, my good friend James English did a very similar um did a, um, a similar thing he made it he went homeless on the streets one christmas in fact it was the inspiration between him making this documentary where he just took a i think he just took a gopro on the street and slept rough for seven days while everyone was enjoying christmas um but it was that documentary that inspired me to do my running home for christmas which was this for people listening that aren't aware, I I ran 200 miles at Christmas. Um, the project was called Running Homeless for Christmas. I started off running around a running track to really add to the, the kind of boredom factor. Um, again, to relate it to, to being homeless. And uh, yeah, but anyway, that's, a, that's another thing again. Yes, really well done, Steve. Thank you. Yes. So what are you up to now? How's the public speaking going? What, how's, how does the uh, housing portfolio look at, look at the moment? Uh, so my portfolio with the project I'm just buying, um, which actually should be complete in the day, takes my portfolio to uh, over 8 million. Um, it's completely changed my life. I now train other people how to do the same, how to make money through property uh, by having the right mindset uh, and the skills that I've learned of 15 years in property. Um, and uh, I've been resting for a while. I've been trying to train, but it's sort of one step back, one step forward, two step back at the moment. Um, the intention is to do another big event this year. But um, my body hasn't took um, too, hasn't been too keen on what I've done, should we say, in terms of that double Ironman. So, when, just kind when, of sort of taking it as it is. When did you do that? Remind us when you did that, Steve. October. So, just over three months ago. Oh, really recently? Yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. So, um, yes, these uh, injuries can take a while to. Um, get back to normal the the body just the mind and the body takes i mean i'm i'm still smashed now if i was honest um but that's why we do these things isn't it yeah <laughs> if they're easy they wouldn't really be a challenge um and how about the um the public speaking house yeah what great again um obviously um with uh, where we are um, we've sort of changed our model and, um, we've, we started doing more stuff online. Um, but yeah, the, the, the training's going really well. It's just come, it's just growing and growing. More people are wanting to work with me because of the results that I'm able to get other people. Uh, I was on Rich House, Poor House last year on channel five and they're doing another special on us this year because, um, the guy I'd done the exchange with. I've put him on our training and he's completely transformed his life, him and his partner. Um, so Channel 5 said because of it being one of the highest viewing ones they've ever put out and it being such an inspirational watch, they've, they're doing a special follow-up on it, um, which is out this year. Wow. Have you ever done that Secret Millionaire programme? No, I'm a bit before my time. We, um, with the homeless millionaire, we, we, we sort of stole the idea a little bit from that, or should I say not stole, but inspired by that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where we, we called ours the homeless millionaire, where it was sort of, um, I was undercover, similar sort of thing, but we wanted to scale it up like I do with everything. I always 
I, I, one Iron Man's not good enough, I need to do two, that sort of thing. And, and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted it to be like the sort of um, the, um, the secret millionaire um, and a sort of homeless program, but banging them together and uh, taking the heroin with it as well, just to put the cherry on the top. Um, and, and again, that took me a long time to recover from that. I, I came off it, but my body wasn't right for probably three months after that. Yes, I've had similar coming off opiate medication after my back surgery. Um, stuff still isn't right, but I've still got uh, tinnitus. Had it, it's been, you know, two years now or whatever. Um, just lots, lot. Just lots of weird stuff seems to happen to your body the older you get. But was was it difficult coming off the heroin? Because that can be absolutely awful. I'm obviously my experience, experience was more prescription. I mean, I smoked heroin in the past. It was, um, but I just remember trying to get off this prescription medication. I used to just look at my my girlfriend and say, "The devil's got me." Yeah, the devil's got me. You know, if there's ever a devil and a god, this is the devil. Yeah, he's got he's got me again. You know, he's got me again in my life. He's got me this. He's got me this way this time. It's it it's it's really hard to put into words, but to try to be getting off something, but then to be feeling so out of sorts in yourself that all you want to do is be back on it. Yeah, you know physically just you you just feel so strange on top of all the 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 painful um experiences you have to go through and even when you think you're out the other side you get stuff that kind of lingers on that that you know really like for me it was the tinnitus you know I, I didn't know when I got off my opiate medication because I suddenly had this to deal with that I hadn't I didn't have this while I was on it, right? How was your experience, Steve? I think uh, the next day was, um, after the first time of doing it, the next day was 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 probably, um, I just felt terrible. Uh, I couldn't eat. I'd lost my appetite. So when I went out there, I was in really good shape. Um, I was training in the gym regular. I was in really good shape, really good condition. Um, I train four or five times a week, regular. I have a good diet. So to go out and to now not train all week, to eat pasties, drink cans of Coke and whatever I was given to sort of get by, to be sleeping on a hard concrete floor um, and then obviously taking heroin, my body was kind of like, shit, what's going on? Um, because I'd been very healthy, consistent with my eating as I am. And uh, <clears throat> it was more, um, I always knew when the heroin weared off that my mind was stronger than the drug. So I knew that I wouldn't, I was able to not go back on it. I was confident of that. That's why I, I done it because I, I was confident. Um, what I wasn't prepared for was probably about, after I, I was fine, so I wasn't taking heroin. It was probably about three weeks after doing it all. I got a feeling I kind of went back to thinking about doing the heroin, and it, it was good. It, it gave me a, it gave me a good feeling, and I kind of thought to myself. I remember I was in my kitchen, and I thought I could probably do this occasionally if I did like one off, and it, it's not really going to do me any harm. And then I just stopped myself and I thought, fucking hell, what are you thinking? Like, you're trying to justify it to yourself to go out and just do some heroin because it'll be all right doing it the one time. And I just thought, shit, um, just how I can see how it gets people. That, that's what I'm saying, because for somebody who's very mentally strong, and to be having a conversation with myself, sort of thinking of it and thinking, oh, I'll probably be able to do this and it won't really do any harm if I did it occasionally. And I just thought, shit, this, this is how it gets you. And I wasn't expecting that. Um, it was more of, um, and that word, what you said, the devil, it kind of sums it up for me because it was kind of, 
I thought I'd beat it. I thought I was off it. And there it was sort of in the background trying to creep up on me in a sneaky sort of way. And um, yeah. that's where I realised I thought, shit, um, what are you thinking? And, and obviously I didn't go do it. Um, but I just, I lost motivation. That, that was the biggest thing. I, I didn't want to train. So going back in the gym, I felt fine within myself. I didn't have any side effects other than I just couldn't get motivated. It took me probably three months. I was going in the gym. I was still, I was still being disciplined. And that's my whole ethos. But I had to grind out every single session for about three months and just did not enjoy going in there. Every single day for a few months just felt like an absolute chore. Um, so, yeah, I guess obviously the stuff that, going on um, in the background at a deeper level. That internal dialogue that you mentioned, the should I, shan't I, I'm going to feel like this, it could be good, it could be good, oh, no, it will be bad. Yeah. That's that's like my life ten times a day for for the last thirty years. Just for just, I'm just putting this out there for us. Yeah. It? This is what I have to negotiate. Um, yeah, you know, it's. Um, the, I'm not saying this is not trying to get people to feel sorry for me. Nothing like that. I'm just saying addictive psychology is a fucking evil thing. You know, it's yeah. it's horrible. It's not something you can just go. Ah, oh, just just. Blah, blah, blah. It, no, it's it it's in you and it's in you every day of 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 your life. And uh, as you get older, especially when you become a parent, you you have to just freaking try to keep the lid on it. You know, you've got to. Yeah. Uh, you got to just try to keep that. Get everything in perspective. Go to the good side. Go into the light. You know stick with what you say take action smile at the morning sun jog around the block get your routine in there you know think positive ignore the fucking idiots which just too many of them you know you you, you got to keep this framework up um talking of frameworks then steve i've never really done this before it's not really one of the not really something i've done on this podcast but you're obviously a man that can motivate yourself to get out there and, and make it work. If, if you had to say five for anyone listening now who's struggling, maybe they're fat and they're 50 and they're thinking I fucked it up. What, what, what are we going to say to what's the thought? What if we have five rules or five, five little gems of inspiration. What, what will we say to them? I would say get clear on what your happy place is. So have a clear desire and a clear vision of uh, where you want to go. I would say pour in uh, good material into your mind. So don't, don't watch the news. Don't read newspapers. Put good positive material into your mind. Put the right sort of people around you. Uh, I would say that you need to be persistent. So be willing to grind. Be willing to work hard. Um, I would say uh, clear goals, so clearly defined goals and break them down and uh, not putting things off. And lastly, give back to other people. So um, giving back for me is, um, it, it, it's, a, it's one of our human needs. We, we're born, if, if you haven't come here to make somebody else's life better, then what's the point? And you come across, obviously, you know, your media presence as a as a prop as the property guy, right? But do you actually do personal development courses? Like, aside from, yeah, I tie it all in. So, I, every bit of training I do has got mindset included into it because you can't do anything. It's the foundations of everything. So, on my property training courses. There's a full day of mindset before we've even touched property because the amount of baggage and shit people carry around, we, we can all probably all relate to this. We, we're all capable of doing something, but when something happens in our life, it takes us off track. So 
there's no good me teaching you loads of property strategies and you're then pissed off because you've got road rage or something's happened with your wife or husband's done something or whatever it is, the kids have frustrated you. Um, all of that stuff derails you. So having that, that inner peace um, and learning how to drop the baggage and, and really build that bulletproof mindset is essential. Once I've taught that, the strategy is the easy bit. Brilliant. And what we're going to do for friends at home, we'll, we'll put all of Steve's links below the YouTube video. So um, if you want to make contact with this amazing man, and I suggest, <laughs> I suggest you do, um, then, you, then you can do that. Steve, let's, oh, let's make this the first of uh, several conversations, mate, because... I could just talk to you forever, really. It's been fa absolutely fascinating. Um, your life experiences and your commitments and your charity work and your um, ph philanthropy and you obviously your results is um, very special, mate. So thank you for coming on the podcast and, and sharing them with us all. Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, that mutual respect's there for many reasons. Oh, brilliant. Stay on the live line, Steve, so I can thank you properly. To everybody at home, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. If you'd be kind enough to like and subscribe so we can get you more of this amazing content, that would be great. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, guys.